TV webinar. And for further proceedings, I'll hand it over to our convener and moderator, Dr. Sergio Rovinsky. Over to you, Dr. Sergio. Okay, so hello, everybody. Uh, hello, everybody from all around the world. I'm Dr. Sergio Rovinsky here from Sao Paulo, Brazil, from Show the Planet. And it's a pleasure for me to, uh, to start this nine Ortho TV and Show the Planet webinar. So today I'm very happy because we are discussing different stuff. Uh, show the planet is growing slowly, I would say outside the shoulder and the elbow and we are starting to begin, I would say a platform of education in other things in orthopedics. I'm very happy with that. And today we have a very special crew on the spaceship. So I'm very happy with new friends, old friends, and I would like to introduce firstly to uh, this huge audience that we are having all of my friends before we start this very interesting webinar. So today we are going to talk about for the arm and distal, uh, and distal radio things, very two interesting lectures. Dr. Uh, Vasudeo is going to talk about uh, percutaneous spinning of complex situations on the forearm, on the adolescent, on the young adult, and on the adult. And Dr. Tufi, who I am about to, to, uh, to present now, is going to talk about when, how, and why to plate the distal radio dorsally. And we still are going to talk about knee, about Hoffa fractures with my good friend, Dr. Robinson. So who is here, my friends? to help me in this, uh, I would say, very interesting and different endeavor. So I'm gonna introduce all of my uh, new friends, old friends, and then I'm gonna just ask her uh, them as usual, just to say hi to this lovely and world audience, and then we can start. So I'm gonna start from India, of course. From India, we have a living legend, Dr. Vasudeo Gadegone. Namaste, sir. Namaskar. Namaste, namaste. Namaskar. Namaste, who lives in the city of Chandrapur, uh, in the state of Maharashtra, in a very uh, faraway zone, and he's a genius. He has been for 35 years or more uh, inventing new implants to fit the socioeconomical status of a very poor uh, uh, population and, uh, and achieving very good final uh, clinical uh, results in, in spite of all of the socioeconomical difficulties are around his universe. Uh, from Brazil, we have four people and four outstanding surgeons. So first of all, let me start with Dr. Robinson. Dr. Robinson Pires from the city of Belo Horizonte in the state of Minas Gerais, 500 kilometers from Sao Paulo. He's my good friend for 17 years now. We are getting old, Dr. Robinson. And the thing is, he's an outstanding orthopedic trauma surgeon, different from me. I am a shoulder and elbow surgeon who does a lot of shoulder and elbow trauma and the degenerative issue, sure. But of course, but he's a, an orthopedic trauma surgeon and he deals with all of the parts of the human body. And today he's gonna talk about the knee, about uh, a different part of the knee which is the posterior part of the femoral condyles. Huh? I guess I am saying uh, correctly, Robinson, which is the Hoffa yeah. fracture. Yeah, uh, it's still from the same city. My new friend, I'm very happy to have my new friend, Dr. Antonio Tufi, which is an outstanding orthopedic trauma surgeon, but he's a hand surgeon and he does a lot of orthopedic trauma. So he's going to tell us about dorsal plating of the radius, the distal radius, which is something very interesting. I'm going to learn a lot. Still from my city, uh, from uh, Sao Paulo, I, I have two good friends, Dr. Elio Cunha, who works with me in my public or in the public hospital in which I, I work for 15 years and from which I've been showing so many cases to my Indian friends since 2008 and 2009. He's an outstanding uh, orthopedic trauma surgeon and he does uh, Elizarov, an external fixator, and he knows a lot about deformities and he's gonna help us too much in the, especially in the knee part. And my old friend who hopefully I have the honor to be together again, Dr. Andre Weinstein. Dr. Andre Weinstein, He's the medical coordinator of the biggest hospital in South America, Albert Einstein. 
and people trust him too much over there. He's a of faculty, just like Dr. Robinson and Dr. Tufi, and he's a fantastic orthopedic trauma surgeon. He knows a lot, and he's going to help us, I'm sure, in all of the in all of the talks. So it's a pleasure, my friends, to have you here. Without you, this would be nothing. So as we have hundreds and, and I, I'm sure thousands of people seeing us, just I, I, I want you guys to say a quick hello to everybody. And first, I have to start with my good friend, the living legend, Dr. Gadegone. Just say hello to our friends, sir, because they hello, are waiting hello, for you. Hello, we'll start. And namaste, namaste. Okay, Dr. Robinson. Uh, we will start now, okay? Okay. Okay, so we will start now. You can share, Dr. Uh, Vasudeo. So, may I talk, sir, now? Yes, yes, yes. you can start, sir. So, welcome all faculties for a very prestigious Nine Shoulder Planet and Ortho TV webinar organized and moderated by Dr. Sergi Orovensky. It is, uh, I am humble that uh, the stalwarts of uh, Brazil, they are with me, Dr. Vanjistin, Dr. Helio Kuna, Antonio Tupi, Robinson Pire. I am honored to be with you, sir, all, and we will share and discuss many things about the trauma. I will share my views on nailing in adult and adolescent forearm fractures. I am Dr. Vasudev Gadegune from Chandrapur, Maharashtra, India, and I am basically a trauma surgeon practicing since last 40 years. The, to begin with, the crux of treatment of forearm fracture, the restoration of the radial bow is important in the reconstitution of the normal architecture of the forearm and in the restoration of the rotation of grip and strength. Hence, non-operative treatment is not advocated by majority and practically it is not advocated in adults. So there are only two options remained, that is intramodular nailing and plate osteosynthesis. Fracture of the forearm should be treated as intraarticular fracture. It is well written in AO manual as well as various test books. They are written on the fractures of the forearm. Hence, a gold standard and most accepted method is open reduction and internal fixation by plate. Plate and screw Fixation, it's a cross view, extensive surgical exposure and periosteal stripping, nobody can deny. Compromise vascular supply, increase operative morbidity, infection up to 2 to 7% described in literature, and refracture after removal of the plate is a main problem after plating fixation. So why not to have an alternative treatment like something which is different from the open method? We have a history of intramodular nail fixation. In the 40s and early 50s, diphyseal forearm nailing with K wires and small rust pins yielded very poor result due to lack of stable fixation. The first oversized straight square shaped rim nail was developed by Street in 1954 and restoration of the radial bow was introduced by Sage in 1959 with the development of the pre-bent nail system to improve the results in the forearm fractures. Pioneer in India, Dr. A.K. Talwarkar designed and propagated the square nail for the management of the forearm fracture. The comparison between the two plate system and intramodular nailing, which is better option? Open reduction and internal fixation with compression plate is a gold standard 
98% union rate is described in literature. Whereas with the Talwalkar square nail, though it is a simple method with better result than conservative treatment, but 92% union rate. That is an original article by the author. This is the example of a fracture both bones of the forearm treated by a square nail. You can see radial view is maintained and there is a good callus formation, but there is a only thing that average period of POP mobilization for six weeks, but it gives a relative stability, good callus formation and union various authors described from 90 to 100%. Big falls of unlock nail, a straight, rigid, thick nail could not restore the radial bow. Thin nail permits rotatory and substantial lateral motion at the fracture site. Therefore, complications like non-union, malunion, infections, nerve palsy, joint stiffness, particularly rotations, jamming of the nail and splitting of the nail of the sharp. You can, innumerable complications are described in literature. And the most important complication is the breakage of the thin nail and implant migration before union and painful prominent hardware and ulnar bursitis. Therefore, for near about 50 years, this both bone forearm nailing with a unlocked nail, thin nail, has gone into disrepute and therefore plating was considered to be a gold standard treatment. But with the newer nails, interlocking capability and enhanced anterostational stability, literature reported their union rate at 95 to 100% in various, uh, author, various uh, publications. The distinct advantage it prevents shortening in a metaphyseal, commutated, and segmental diphyseal forearm fracture because after nailing and restoration of length, the, nail, the bone is locked with the nail by two screw proximally and distal to maintain the length. So in comparison between the locked intramedial nailing and plate osteosynthesis, in conclusion, the two fixation method it similar results in terms of functional healing and patient satisfaction in the management of adult forearm fractures. But what is this interlock nailing? It is one of the example, nicely done surgery with proximal and distal locking. Interlock nailing is a technically demanding procedure because it's a very small hole through which Jig, we have to put the screw of 2.7 in the metaphysis, and it is very difficult to achieve the uh, to get this hole in the proximal part near the radial neck, and there is always a danger of injury to the posterior intraosseous nerve pin. And therefore, we have to find out something good which will achieve both the function as a it will maintain the length as well as it will give a stable fixation. And that is a new concept in the treatment of forearm fracture with screw intramedullary nail. This is my paper. I must have done now more than 200 cases of a fracture, both bone forearm fractures, published in Indian Journal of Orthopedic 2012, 96% excellent to good results. Biological method of forearm fracture by screw IM nail. The results are comparable to plating by closed method. You also make your choice for nailing in next case, Sergio. I assure you, you shall never regret. The screw nail or thalon nail, it's nothing but the thalon nail available in diameter 2, 2.5, 3, 3.5 mm, variable length, titanium of steel, a threaded head at the end of the nail. You can see here, 
self cutting threads to be screwed with the screw driver into the metaphysis screw head is placed at the end of the bone in the metaphysis to prevent to prevent you can see in the ulna in the metaphysis radius in the metaphysis to prevent a migration so it maintains the length as well as it prevents the rotational movement of the fracture what is the properties of this nail nail should be sufficiently elastic to bend as it traverses the canal from the point of insertion resilient enough to spring back to its pre bend contour when finally seated because that is the most important if the bowing is lost everything is lost rigid enough to withstand the torsional rotational and angulatory forces so this is an example it's a most unstable displaced fracture of the both bone forearm treated by close technique you can see here how the sitting of this the screw in the metaphysis and in allah it is and you can see here and restoration of the radial bow which is so essential can be achieved by this and use elastic nail for restoration of the radial bow another how to do it nail mounted on a chuck bowing of the radius can be achieved by the proper contouring of the nail the inserter should firmly grasp the nail in order to control insertion and nail withdrawal because that is the most important step when you negotiate the nail through the fracture side and you have to do a pull push through technique this is the method you can use a forearm distractor or in a fresh fracture manual traction is enough before you plan the treatment you must assess the length and diameter of the diameter of the canal in a normal forearm close reduction is achieved by longitudinal traction and direct pressure direct pressure at the fracture site confirm in image intensifier if you are in doubt and there is some translation of the fragment medial or lateral anterior or posterior k wire assisted percutaneous reduction is required and you can align the fracture fragment i will show you how to align it but in some of the cases in 10 to 15% of the cases you may require mini open reduction because you fail to reduce by close method because of the soft tissue interposition sometime ulnar nail entry tip of the olecranon and you can see here with the help of a steenman pin or a bone hole and you can see how it is done this is how it is this is a, a small uh, with this small incision and uh, with the straight owl we have to create a hole in the tip of the uh, olecranon and then you find out the canal of the ulna with the with the help of the steen bun pin 4 mm steen bun pin or 3 mm you have to pass and then create a find out the canal so then rimming of the canal is most important thing we have to rim the canal to assess the diameter and we want to also have a good quality of at least 3 mm uh, ulnar nail 3 3.5 it is possible if you use it less than 2.5 probably it does not work and this is how a k wire is passed percutaneously to align the fracture fragments then after what insertion of the nail near the fracture site and manipulate the reduction under the fluoroscopic control you can see here how and then it is required how to do and then you can screw the screw nail in the metaphysis so this is the most important step where we have to align the fracture fragment radiation nail entry identification of the entry point with k wire window through the radial styloid between tendon of a extensor carpi longi longus and extensor pollicis brevis this is this is and we have to avoid we must have a, uh, this surface marking of the radial nerve and you must understand where the radial nerve is it is more of a dorsal side dorsolateral 
than on the so therefore your incision should be more of a lateral side so incision is dilated you can see a small incision is given and incision is dilated by a artery forceps to prevent a radial nerve injury and you can see here how this and curved bone all is inserted here and just check it in say crm picture so we have to make this uh, hole in the metaphysis and then reduction of this fracture is done and sometime you may require a reaming in the radius because the radius is a curved bone and sometime the isthmus junction it is mostly a narrowest part and in that case you probably may require a and then the nail is passed you may take the help of the kyr and once you have passed the fracture site then it is better to do a screwing so that it takes the shape of the radius and then uh, you stop the screwing in the metaphysis the nail was advanced with a smooth oscillating movement until the tip reaches the proximal fragment of the metaphysis sometime we may require some light blows of a mallet to introduce through the fracture site because it is sometime impossible to negotiate with the hand so this is how use of a percutaneous k wire to assist the reduction in a displaced fracture now after doing a nailing in the ulna you can see here in the radius there is a some translation the nail has come to the fracture side but aligning is very important so just to take k wire side align the fracture fragment see in the ap and lateral x ray and just push the nail in the opposite cortex and this is the this is the image of the k wire stabilization reduction remi and you can see lastly we have to put this screw in the don't hammer it because the hammering will create a problem removal of the problem will be there and it may be loosened also so this is the remar and this is the introduction of the nail and this is you can see a very small incision rim nail in ulna and mostly unrimmed nail in the radius because the radius nail diameter should be less otherwise it is very difficult to mold along with the radius curvature traction release nail forwarded and before you close the wound you must find out is there any distraction that is the most important so you have to compress it see the all the moment whether your fixation is stable or not and this is the exactly you can see in the metaphysis one or two serrations we keep out otherwise removal is difficult and this subcondral bone placement will prevent your shortening so this is how in a disparity of the canal how it is to be done because the radius is a funnel in the proximal part and distally it is narrow in that case another nail of a different size this is the translation different size of the nail length passed across the fracture site into the medullary canal till further negotiation is not possible so as soon as you pass a small stabilizing nail there is alignment of the fracture fragment uh, along with the nail and this is the example unstable fracture with a wide canal proximally this is this tool. and you can see here this is the translation is there and how the translation gets corrected you can see here this is how and you can findingly as soon as the nail small nail crosses the fracture side the alignment of the medullary canal a can occur this is how it is again you can see it here this is the track this is the translation and translation is corrected because both the fragments of the fracture they are aligning and this is the same example of the this stack nail and good reduction and restoration of the radial length mostly clothes and cosmetic procedure use a boil block past achieve a stable fixation if required by uh, stacking a boil block cast this is another example you can see here how this is fracture both bone this is the entry point and how with the k wire the fracture is aligned and this is how a very small incisions uh, you can do the surgery so i will share now the examples 
fracture at the same level, unstable fracture, plating is the only treatment of this. I don't deny, but you can see here how a radiological and functional outcome of this patient after four months of follow. -up. Another example, the upper one third fracture, interlocking, it is very difficult. If you do a plating also, there is always a problem of the posterior interosseous nerve. This method prevents injury to the posterior interosseous nerve. It is common to observe while doing plating and interlock nailing. Another example, very distal fracture of the ulna and a fracture of the uh, radius like Galagia fracture. You can see here a restoration of the radial bow, restoration of the functional and interlock. Uh, this is the this is another example, fracture both bone from at a different level. Again, you can see there is a perfect restoration of the radial bow, healing by callus formation and good functional outcome. This is another a very distal third. It is like a Galagia fracture. You can see here at the junctional zone, very unstable fracture. Stack nailing, restoration of this bow and perfect union and function. So I can show you an innumerable example of this thing. Another example, most unstable fracture, fracture both bone at the same level. And you can see how nicely the fracture stack milling up. We have to find out whether the nail right. is stable or not. In that case, you can use a stacking in one of the bones. So this is in conclusion of this stacking milling, stack flexible milling technique of radius ulna in adult can be a viable and easier alternative to floating. We can confidently avoid plaster immobilization of kneeling. Another example, inferior radial nerve joint is displaced. This is the fracture both more. He is 110 kg. Two wires are passed and you can see perfect restoration function of the anatomy. In a comminuted fracture, it is said that the nailing is contracting it. But if the length is maintained and the fracture is left closed, the bone grafting is not necessary. The heel, actually the loose fragment, the heel around the nail, just we have to maintain the length at the two end. Close reduction, intramodulary fixation. So it can maintain the length if the nail is placed properly, subchondral bone and comminuted fracture heals around the nail. Revision surgery for plate failure, modified Nichols technique, plate failure, and this is the restoration of the function and union. Another example, osteoporotic lady, failure of this hybrid osteosynthesis, done a nailing and a bone grafting fracture united. So after this, I will go to Galagia fracture. Reported incidence of fracture pattern is estimated to be 7% of the all forearm fracture in adult. Anatomical consideration, radius is a curved bone. Its concavity faces the ulna. The medullary canal of the radius is funnel shaped in the distal third and curved and narrow in the middle third. Because of this anatomical configuration, the radius is somewhat unsuitable for the intramodulary fixation, I don't deny. And plating of this fracture of the radius is the most suitable method. Provides rigid internal fixation and stable reduction of the distal radio ulnar joint. However, soft tissue dissection entails various complications if it is not done properly and if the anatomical uh, anatomy is not restored of a radial bone. So this is another paper I published in Indian Journal of Orthopedics, Percutaneous Osteosynthesis of a Galagia Fracture Dislocation. And I will share some of my cases. So bowing of the radius can be achieved by a proper contouring of the nail. This is to maintain the normal rotation of the radius on ulna. And you can see here, this is the height of a Galagia fracture. Inferior radial nerve joint is dislocated and perfect restoration and union of the fracture after four months follow-up. Huge pre-contour nail for radius. How to I do it? Same window through the radial styloid between the tendon of external 
extensor carparadial is longus and brevis uh, this extensor pollis is brevis same principle as i show and we have to do the same pattern of nailing uh, as you do in both borum forearm fracture pitfalls and pearls in the galagia fracture what happens now when the nailing a distal shaft fracture the tip of the nail will cross the fracture side here and press on the opposite cortex because our entry is eccentric we are going from the wide canal to our narrower canal so what will happen there will be a, some displacement may occur in the low galagia fracture in that case what we have to do is same you can see here how the translation can be corrected by a thinner nail shorter nail and just with as soon as you correct the translation you cut the nail to that level and you can see how beautifully the alignment of this uh, this fracture has been done so two nails of a different length and size stack together provide a stable fixation in both angulatory and rotational plane so additional rust nail you can put it here and you can impact into the metaphysis so this is the example you can see here there is a translation and it is corrected by putting a additional nail another what is the problem of dru joint sometime it is possible in that case the forearm is rotated to assess stability of the construct and any distal radial nerve joint instability and if it is unstable i use a 2 to 2.5 mm k wire from ulna to radius in a reduced position for at least 3 weeks to stabilize the inferior joint this is the example of this galagia fracture most displaced fracture with inferior radial dislocation you can see a radial bow is maintained stacking at the fracture site and this patient has done very well another examples after this a high galagia fracture restoration with the stacking after removal and full function so there are so many innumerable examples i can quote with this that yes radial bow can be maintained it unites by secondary intention callus formation and inferior radial nerve joint can be managed by a supination cast for at least there this is another example very displaced fracture unstable you can see here the nail is stacked and ulno radial wire and full function and can compare with the normal there is a it is very difficult whether this is the which fracture uh, the which bone is fractured close intramural nail can be also be done in a isolated ulna fracture this is a lower one third this is a segmental fracture <clears throat> this is another lower one third fracture segmental fracture this is in the radius you can see isolated radius just put the fragment together everything heals around the nail if the nail if the length is maintained and you can see here is such a comminuted fracture maintaining the length is also a difficult but we have to choose a proper length of the nail and fixation if you do a plating also there is always a chances on for beginner a injury to the posterior intraosseous nerve other example and there is a healing of fracture so the same principle i use in adolescent fracture only thing is that we have to change the entry point or proximally lateral entry point as you know everybody and this screw fits into the sparing the epiphyseal sparing part and one or two we can keep outside to remove this thing same thing is for radius on the lateral side and these are all examples you can see here how this is the sparing of the epiphysis it is a sparing of the epiphysis here is also you can see the sparing of the epiphysis what this additionally by elastic in, instead of using a plain elastic nail this serrations they fit into the metaphysis prevents rotational movement therefore patient can be mobilized early in children because only they require a mobilization a healing of fracture for at least 6 to 8 weeks the fracture heals these are all examples you can see here these are all examples of the forearm adolescent fracture they are healed beautifully with restoration of the radial bone
so against nailing what is the against nailing is a plaster causes a permanent stiffness of the joint i think it's a myth a uninjured joint never gets stiff if immobilized up to 6 weeks in any form of splint or plaster jan chanle this has already been described in the test book of a conservative methods of the fractures incomplete reduction of the one bone <clears throat> might produce a distraction of the other bone a very a very famous photographs of this scene this is ulna is a relatively straight bone so no issues in nailing simple principle of three point fixation thicker rim nail to prevent back out problem is with the radius to restore the radial bow if you restore the radial bow every all problems will be solved so caution what to do when you are putting eccentric entry hands use a pre bend nail to restore radial bow in clinical practice is rarely observed but with the careful thumping and compression distraction can be reduced and if at all it occurs for example of a bone one bone is uniting other bone is so there is a translation not uniting and you can see additional plating revise with additional plating keeping the nail in situ and the fracture has united so some loss of radial bow how loss of radial bow leads to restriction of the rotation of the forearm that is against nailing as the platers they say is a myth good union and full function at the foreman this is the same picture you can see here an example of some loss of radial bow such a displaced fracture of the you can see both bone forearm this has been treated no functional impairment is seen so if the loss of bow is because with the nailing you get a smaller loss of bow not a much loss and now this is the example of a segmental fracture of the radius done by a close method there is a some translation there is a some inferior radial nerve joint disparity you can see still the fracture is united after 12 months full function close technique so this is also a dilemma okay. when even after a some disparity in inferior radial nerve joint the functionally this patient is good general observation some terminal rmo may be lost especially in supination of the forearm but the majority of the work which can be performed without full supination and over the period they compensate and you can see here these are all the things they do it by some limited motion of the supination so how this is how it is a distal third fracture at the same level terminal loss of rmo but no problem with the patient and you can see the fracture is united perfectly but there is a some problem a full supination so proposition how it compensation when both forearm bones are fractured if the radial bow is lost the ulna and shoulder probably adapts to allow a full rotation in isolated radial soft fracture it is probably more important to retain the radial bow and how it compensation can occur this is how it is you can see here this is supination this is pronation but when there is a discompensation you can see here how it comes this is there is a rotational movement here it is coming forward your elbow is coming forward and it is compensating for the uh, loss of supination and you can see here also this is how it is the supination is lost and you can see the elbow is coming forward and this is because there is a shoulder girdle is still there it is normal and therefore though it is not a very perceptible on clinical practice so nothing always works highly comminuted fracture fractures at the ends of the bone and narrow canal if you are not able to negotiate more than 2.5 or 2.5 it is better to go ahead with the plating and conversion to plate in a low galaxy of fracture on table may require in 15 to 20% of the basis that when you take the patient for a fracture both bone forearm or galagia fracture keep ready the plating system because if you are not able to do a proper reduction and uh, the fixation it is better to convert this this nailing into a procedure of the plating so you should not be adamant that i will not do plating only i will 
do annealing. So in my practice, in Galagia fracture, 15 to 20 percent may need a plating after starting annealing. But in forearm fracture, merely 5 percent. Non-union of radius, as I said, this is the example. You can see here some disparity is seen here. There is some problems because of the thin nail and then ultimately revive with plate and bone grafting. So we can do a revision. There is no problem. But from the first time, you cannot say that nailing does not work. So literature grossly inadequate. Even Google PubMed. So <clears throat> do not show enough references regarding nailing in adult forearm fracture. These are all my records. You can see here. So meticulous record of operated patient by me is a Google and PubMed for me. <laughs> and you can <laughs> say new interlocking nail, a literature in conclusion. Intramodern kneeling of adult forearm diaphyseal fracture appears to be a good <laughs> alternative to plate osteosynthesis. I don't say that it is a replacement of osteosynthesis, but it's a good alternative. And I also believe the same thought process. Plate fixation versus intramural nailing for both bone forearm fractures. Meta-analysis, IM nail is associated with a shorter operation time and lower complication rate as compared to the open reduction and internal. This is the World Journal of Surgery, 2017. My observation is the same. I started in the beginning by doing plate. I have also attended the two, three courses of the AO primary, advanced, and specific also. But today, if I are given a chance, I will definitely prefer nailing as the first size. Mini invasive biological method of fixation. Mini invasive. There are no scarless sometimes. And you can see here how it is well executed. It is very difficult to recognize which fracture, which bone is fracture and where is the incision. Your, your wife also cannot see where is the incision. So you decide open or close method surgery. Choice is yours. I don't say. It's a choice is yours. You can see here. This is the fracture and this is the plating system here and there. An ugly scar and a beautiful lady. She cannot wear even the clothes also properly. So this is how it is. Choice is yours. Advantages of intramodal nailing, three-point fixation. Implant stress sharing behavior which leads to secondary periosteal callus for this. No chances of refracture. Mostly scarless custom is cosmetic surgery. Implant migration prevented as screw fits into the metaphysis of radius and ulna. So take home message. Plaster is the past. Present is the plate. But believe on me, future will be of a close intramodulary nailing. So Thanks to all my forearm nailing patients and participants. And also I thank my dear friend Sergio for giving me an opportunity to express my views on the both bone forearm fracture. Though it's a controversial, even a test book also does not substantiate that the nailing is a good option. Still, I have presented in front of you and I can show you innumerable examples where I am successful. Probably you will be also successful if you do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. So let me make some comments. Uh, and now everybody's coming again. So, well, sir, it's a lovely lecture. Uh, I'm flattered for having you showing us this beautiful journey you had in your life doing these things. I'm very, very content about it. But I would like to discuss some things before other speakers, they start to say. And I have some doubts and at least one or two, which I think are very important from the, uh, what we do when we operate these cases. So see, for, uh, sir, I'm gonna just make one, uh, one first statement because we have many juniors, many beginners here. So from a historical perspective, you'll see how interesting sir if we think about the tibia and we think about the femur 15 or 50 40 years ago maybe 30 years ago all of the world were doing non-locked nailing with many implants rush nails and endronails and we had all of the problems you mentioned it malrotation 
back out of the implants and then the world understood that we should do locket nailing of the femur and of the tibia. And now we are using the same principle. So this is the idea, sir. And this is very important. This is very logical. And uh, this is something for the juniors to understand all of this principles because, sir, when we are talking about the tibia, the femur, the radius and the ulnar, we are talking about long bones and the principles, they basically are not different. But having said that, sir, the thing is, you show it some lock in nails in the beginning, which I think that would, they would be very difficult to remove. Uh, and this is something that I would say is uh, relatively uh, resolved by you, sir, because I think that whenever you have to take out all of these implants of yours, is the nail with the screw, it's not exactly difficult. And it's not, I would say, very harmful from a soft tissue point of view. So I have two questions, sir. And, I, and then I would like to listen to the panelists, especially regarding my second questions. The first is, whenever you have to take out these implants that you beautifully described it, sir, is it difficult, especially on the radius? Because on the una, on the olecra, no, I think it's a little bit easier. What about the difficulties in removing these implants? And secondly, and Dr. Robinson remembers that, when we were in the, in the last webinar, when you were showing us your beautiful technique and similar technique on the clavicle, sir, we were discussing, and I discussed it a lot with Dr. Robinson, that opening the focus to do an open uh, reduction with a mini open, as you mentioned it, it's not a scene because I learned it in my residency that it was a scene and then you would go to hell if you did this. And we discussed it a lot that it would be not a scene if you do a mini open whenever needed, not all of the times, but whenever needed. So having the same principle, don't you think that if someone, especially less experienced that, than you, sir, do a mini open to do a reduction, that would be something quite acceptable because in spite of that, we would still have a minimally invasive surgery. I would like you to comment on this both sides especially on the second issue, because I think this is very important from a practice, a practical point of view, especially for beginners. And then I would like to listen to the panelists about this. So uh, what you talk you. A wonderful question. Thank you, Sergio, sir. What happens the screw threads, two or three, we have to keep outside so that if you give incision while removing, you are just able to see that it is the screw here. And there is no problem of identifying the site because of now we are doing all it is under CR picture. So we give mm -hmm. a small incision, locate with the K wire, then nibble out some bone at the screw level, put a screwdriver and screw just screw. don't rotate it in. Because the, it is in the metaphysis, so removal of the screw is not a very difficult job. In okay. case, if it is tugged up and also, so what we can do, you just do a nibbling around the screw hole by giving a very, probably it will be a very small, a very uh, difficult, very large incision as compared to the, the previous incision, but you can identify nipple at all, then with the uh, nose flyer, you can remove it. That is the one. Second, on the contrary, beginner should do, try one or two times if it is a close induction is there. Otherwise, it is better to give a very small incision up near about two centimeter. Yeah. Negotiate the nail through the proximal fragment, see it, then again put it into the distal fragment. You have two advantages. If the canal is very narrow, you can do a retrograde rimming of the canal. Mm -hmm. I do integrate rim, but you can do a retrograde and see the canal also. That also possible so that you can pass a thicker nail. Small mini incision does not give any problem in healing as well as bone healing and wound healing. And I think beginners should try first in Alna, yes. mostly a close technique, but in the radius probably you may require some open reduction. Now, which nail to be first? Whenever I do a nailing, I take the patient after reduction, one of the two bones will be reduced whether it will mm. be radius or ulna. So do a nailing in a reduced bone first. Yes. Whether it is a radius or ulna, 
mostly it is the ulna which is very straight so that you can easily negotiate the nail also radius. so perform the nailing of the ulna and then you go for the radius so yeah. radiously there will be some translation will always be there because now you cannot give attraction so that with the k wire you manipulate and align the fragment you can use the 2k wire also here anterior posterior and medial lateral also to manipulate or you can also give a hole in the percutaneous you can use a sans pin also there is no problem you align the fracture fragment unique article eccentrically place sans pin up near about 2.5 or 3 mm and then you just negotiate so it is not a very deep but i say a new comer should try one or two time it doesn't come give a very small inch see the fracture side and negotiate so because sir see this is something that i have been listening for a lot of time minimally invasive surgery is a is a philosophy rather than being a scene to do a mini open approach so i think this is very important and in my humble opinion sir i don't do this technique but even if you go for 2 cm to 3 or three and something it's still reasonable rather than be spending 10 hours passing the nail especially if you don't have experience i think that this is very important and we discussed that on your clavicle presentation dr robinson was uh, telling that he agrees with me and i learned this concepts over there but having said that i would like to listen to the panelists about this beautiful lecture and especially again this idea of whenever needed doing a mini open approach on the focus because we have many juniors and they and i think that this is important for especially beginners dr robinson you start my friend any issues any comments about this very interesting technique thanks sergio i think dr gadegun is always thinking out of the box uh, yeah, he's yeah, out impressive of the box. it's outstanding presentation congratulations professor Uh, this is a very very nice cost effective technique uh, i like it the reduction maneuvers that you have used using k wires yeah uh, I, i love it the the polar nail no because we know <laughs> the polar screw but yeah. we we have seen here the polar nail and it's very important even using a minimally invasive approach uh, a, a nail technique it's very important to have bone contact so some degree of bone contact is necessary for for fracture repair so i love it, this technique congratulations thank you and it sergio you asked me about the need of sometimes the need of uh, minimally uh, a mini open for reduction yes. of the fracture it's not yeah. a crime So yeah. uh, as we told you uh, at the last uh, uh, yes. webinar uh, yeah. it's very important to reduce the fracture to have bone contact uh, to to have the possibility of a good fracture repair it's very very important yeah okay so you agree with me i guess this is a, a principle for juniors we have met hundreds of juniors seeing us and we have to think about them but i would really like to to listen Dr. Weinstein, you know, I know you have a lot of experience in trauma. Any any comments on this? You know, it's, it's something we don't do here. You have a lot of experience, and please, my friend, apart from your comments, again, your thoughts about mini open. What do you think about that? Whenever needed, of course. Uh, first of all, thank you, Sergio, and all my friends. Namaste, Professor Gadegon. It was a brilliant uh, class. I think it's it's very important uh, to understand the, the rea reality that we are living. Uh, sometimes we have uh, different uh, surgical approaches, surgical opinions, and even surgical um, settings that uh, we we try to do our best for our patients. So I think this is the spirit of this whole uh, class. I think the class it was amazing. Uh, it's completely different than my, my daily practice. Uh, and for me, I, I, I'm really used to do the mini open when I can't reduce the fracture uh, in a few minutes. I think it's uh, easier. Uh, I think you don't have any uh, issues about uh, the fracture consolidation and uh, the surgical uh, length is it's much uh, smaller. So 
uh, for me, it's it's a good uh, practice to do the mini opening. Okay, and any on the comments uh, you would like to do before Dr. Tufi speaks? Dr. Actually, Dr. Andre? actually I, I became very interested about this technique. Maybe I will try someday. Uh, maybe <laughs> there will be new implants that uh, you can control the rotation. I think it's it's a good option, especially for UNA, for radios. Uh, for me, it's a little bit different, but thank you, thank you, Vedegon. I think it's uh, a very nice opportunity to know different uh, people and different techniques. Yes, you know, this is one of the beautiful things of this webinar because we see different things. And as Dr. Robinson says, Dr. Gadegone, he thinks out of the box. So we are always seeing different implants. Even if we don't do that, it's very interesting to know and to understand the concepts. And I really love it what Dr. Robinson said about the polar screw nail, which is, you know, he's doing the same thing that people do on the tibia, which is very interesting. But I really want to listen to the hand surgeon now. Your thoughts, Dr. Tufi, as a hand surgeon who does a lot of hand trauma. No, we are not listening to you, sir, uh, the microphone. Sorry. Okay. Congratulations, Dr. Gadigon. Uh, uh, really impressed you with um, your results. When I was resident in, in orthopedics, you used to do intermedular nail for forearm fractures, especially for transverse and short oblique fractures. But you use it um, intermedular nail from Rush, Rush's nail. And um, uh, we have some good results, not as yours, because you show us um, more complex fractures, include the Galeas fractures. Um, I'm not sure um, if I, I, I use the intermedular nail for Galeas fracture. And uh, I, would like to know if you have some tip to to treat the distal radial ulnar joint instability with QR, if um, you doesn't matter to, with the QR broken or another tip for us. And before that, uh, Dr. Gadegone, I would ask that, that wasn't on my mind, uh, and I want you and Dr. Tufi to say, in difficult cases, I don't have experience, but in difficult cases, what do you think uh, you and Dr. Tufi to do a mini open to ease, to ease the reduction of the distal radio, uh, radio zone or joint whenever needed? Because sometimes we have uh, interposition, Dr. Tufi, of some of the extensors. So sometimes you would have to do a mini open to, uh, to, to take it out and put it in supine position and pass the key wire after you do nailing or plating of the radius. So your thoughts about that, Dr. Gardegone, and then Dr. Tufi about uh, when you have interposition. If I do remember, it was extensor ulnari carpis, but I, I don't recall exactly. But what do you think about that? This is a very practical question, sir, for especially for, for juniors, but for, uh -huh. for us too. Sir, may I answer? So after doing, what is most crux of importance is the maintenance of the radial length and bow. If it, that is not restored, bow and length and anatomical reduction by any methods, then because if you do this thing, inferior radial are not automatically reduced. But in some time, it's become so unstable. Mm -hmm. In that case, we require a stabilization with the alno radial wire. But in my practice, I have never come across with the unreduced inferior radial nerve joint in bone forearm fracture or galliard fracture. Maybe it may be in the distal radius fractures uh, that uh, uh, may be in the distal radius fracture where there is a, some communication on, communication on the medial part of the radius. But the radial sharp fracture, I have never come across, maybe other, uh, they have come across with the unreduced inferior radial nerve joint. But, but, but Dr. Gardegone, 
Have you ever had to open the distal radius uno joint? No, no. That is what I am telling. That in my practice, I never had this occasion to open the inferior radial nerve joint. Okay. But probably I don't deny that it may be once upon a time you may come. Out. No, no. I, I, I am mentioning that because, as we know, it's, it's described on literature. Yes, Doctor Tufi. Dr. Tufi, have you ever had to uh, open the, the uh, a, a dorsal approach on the distal radial ulnar joint to be able to reduce the, the distal radial ulnar joint? Because I think that that would be difficult. I only know this in the books, but what do you tell me? I know you do a, a lot of uh, complex for the arm and hand trauma, sir. So I would love to hear you, Dr. Tufi. I have it. To open in, I remember in two opportunities for open fractures, mm. um, galeazzi open fractures with a dorsal and bowler uh, displaced. And uh, I found an uh, interposition with extensor carpionaris tendon and uh, a volsion from TFCC. Mm -hmm. And I have to repair TFCC. Uh, my favorite um, technique is with the, the anchor bone suture. Mm -hmm. And um, it's important to open the reduction, um, open the joint to, to do a, a good reduction and precise fixation. You, you did, we have to put in the supination mm -hmm. to, to maintain the reduction before to fix the distal radial ulnar joint. For me, it's important to, to do this. I never mind with to, to do a, an open incision to guarantee my reduction or my precise reduction. But you, you mean in the dorsal part of the wrist? Yes, the dorsal. Um, I used to do a, an approach in the dorsal and isolate the um, extensor propped digit kints and uh, in the floor of 50 compartment, I open the, 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 um, the joint and uh, proceed the reduction. And you have to protect the extensor carpi ulnaris, ex especially the floor of the, sex, uh, the sixth compartment. Okay. 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 Uh, Dr. Weinstein and Dr. Robinson, any, uh, any chance you had in your life to, uh, to open the wrist to, to, to be able to reduce the distal radial, uh, radial zonar joint. I never saw that in my life. But if you had any, no? Uh, no never? No, neither. No, never. 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 Okay. Dr. Weinstein. Same thing. The, the same never. thing. Never. Never. Okay, lovely. And Dr. Elio, any comments on this beautiful presentation? No, it was a, a brilliant presentation. I think it's a different approach to forearm fractures, and I have, I'm happy to, to be part of this, this webinar. Okay, very nice. Uh, I'm going to do a last so, statement. Uh, uh, Dr. Robinson, he wants to say something. Just, just one comment. Uh, I, I think it's very important to highlight that uh, Dr. Gadigun has shown that uh, pre-bending the nail is important for the restoration of the radial bowl. Yeah. However, in some cases, we have some degree of loss of the radial bowl, and we have a compensation of the, 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 the elbow to uh, restore the function of the patient. Okay. And the function is very, very good. So good. this is... Uh, probably a message that pro probably when doing plates, we are maybe we have an overkill, you no? Know? The need of anatomic restoration of the radial ball is maybe an overkill because okay. we, uh, Dr. Gadogun, yeah, this is a very, very interesting message. And, and, I, and I would like to, to say something. Uh, I have zero experience with these things you were telling but I have a huge experience with terrible triads of the elbow, a lot of good results, some very bad results, but I see them very frequently in our public uh, hospital in which I am with Dr. Elio. And many times in terrible triads, they lose a little bit of supination. This is very common. 
and a little bit of pronation, but they adapt with the shoulder and the elbow. And in the end, they adapt a lot. So I think that the, the idea is the same. This is a very important, but I have a last question for you guys before we move to Dr. Tufi's presentation, which is when you do a plate in a galeazzi, I know that the, the standard way is the Thompson approach, but you can do it from a Voller approach. Any preference? This is a good question for everybody. We have many juniors seeing us. They do a, 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 a lot of similar cases in India, in Asia. Dr. Tufi, start to you because you're a hand guy. Any preferences? It's the Thompson and no discussion on maybe the extended water approach. It, this is a, a, a very good question, sir. Yes, it's, it's a very good question. Uh, I love the Voller approach. I don't wow. do Thompson approach in, in my practice. Normally, I, I use the Voller extended approach and uh, I'm so happy with the, this approach. I think it's better to put the, the plate in um, by volar side and um, because the, the Thompson's approach, sometimes you have to remove the implant. Mm -hmm. I don't have this problem with the volar approach. So I do all Galeaz fractures by volar approach. Okay, Dr. Robinson, I want to listen to you. My preference is volar as well. Volar? Volar. Okay, yes. not the oh. Thompson. Dr. Weinstein. No. Dr. Uh, actually, Weinstein. I do both. And actually, I do both, but mostly Voller. And, and I also have a question for Dr. Gadegon uh, about commutative fractures, especially at the UNA. Uh, how, how do you control the rotation with the nails? Because I think it, even with plates, it's not easy to, to do them. Uh, excuse uh, me, Dr. Uh, Dr. Gadegoni, just to be clear, Dr. Weinstein, you are talking especially about the distal third or the, the, the mid third of the UNA? Uh, mid third also, because uh, when you have a commutative fracture, especially at the UNA, it's very hard to, to maintain the length and control the rotation. Okay, Dr. Gadegoni, please. Yes. Sir, it's not very difficult. We have to give a traction and achieve the leg and put the nail into the subchondral bone. Subchondral mm -hmm. bone is a solid bone and the metaphysis you are putting the screw. So what your nail leg must go into the subchondral of a hard bone so that you achieve the length. And you know that if you do, we are mobilizing for near about four to six weeks in whatever the position is comfortable. And till that time, everything's gummed up. So six weeks is enough time. So in that case, majority of the cases in Salna, I have never seen in the radius single bone also, non-union is taking place because the compressive forces, they keep the fragment together and there is early healing. Everything's allowed, uh, heals around the nail. So you just forget about the small pieces here and there. Don't do anything. Just maintain the length and fix the both the ends in a proper length. That's enough. Yeah. And your, Dr. Vasudeo, in your technique, do you use a, a plaster all of the cases, all of the time? Majority cases, unless it is stacked. In a stacked nailing, it may not require because it is a rigid fixation. It is up to the, you can say, I have not compared, but uh, the standard of plating. But only okay. in the single bone fracture, in the, you slightest doubt of your rotational moment. So you check in the CR picture. If there is a two fragments are moving, then apply a plaster. I use stack it. If it is not moving, then probably four weeks is enough for it. So there are okay. tests. You can go and see in the uh, image and tissue or a live. Okay. So can, okay, sir. Okay. Okay. Well, that's lovely. It's very interesting for us to see. Uh, as Dr. Weinstein was telling, if this implant comes to Brazil, we can think about using this because it's minimally invasive. And I fully agree that with it plates, the, the, it the soft cost, tissue- It does not cost anything. It is in the dollars. If you say it is probably a $5 uh, cost of that particular implant. So it's in okay. dollars, everything you can pinch. Okay, so you will send them to us, sir. Yeah. Now you will start sporting to Brazil. Okay. 
Okay, oh, this okay. is your new business, your new business, lovely. Oh, oh. So let's go now to Dr. Tufis. I'm very interested in his talk about when, why, and how to do dorsal plating of the distal radius. Dr. Tufi, please share and we can see your interesting uh, presentation, sir. So hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with this big team. Thank you, Sergio, for the invitation and for this opportunity. Today, we are going to talk about dorsal plate in distal radius fractures. When, why, and how to do this. Um, in the past, Abraham Coles was already said that despite the malunion, the function will be satisfactory with minimal pain. But nowadays, some people became unhappy with deformity from the conservative treatment. The epidemiology, uh, the epidemiology shows us that 85% of these fractures are dorsal and 15% are volar displaced. And 50% are extraarticular and 50% have interarticular involvement. Currently, the energy of trauma has increased. We found greater joint commitment, younger patients and elderly patients with high demand in a bimodal distribution causing pain and dysfunction. There are many classifications for the different fractures patterns, but for me, it's important to determine the key fragments as per the Hintringer classification, because different fractures need different solutions. The main objectives in the distal radius fractures are metaphysical alignment and joint congruence. We have to think about this all the time. So to maximize the patient's outcomes, we need to focus on patient specific treatment, customize your treatment and to achieve that pain-free and functional risk. For this, we have to reduce the complications of management make an appropriate implant choice and precise surgical execution interoperatively to fix the fracture. The AAOS recommends vitamin C to reduce the complex regional pain syndrome. It's a big complication for us, it's a big problem. And the last but not the least, encourage the early motion. So we have to decide between dorsal or volar fixation. What's the best? For me, we need to, to do the precise indication for the, any kind of fracture. The history shows us that the dorsal fracture was equal to the dorsal plate. They start to put plate on the dorsal. And dorsal plate has the follow advantages. Joint visualization, for me, is the best one. Identifying the associated carpal injuries and providing dorsal support for the fracture. But there are complications in up 32% of this kind of fixation, especially those related to the extensor tendons. Um, irritation and ruptures. On the other hand, the volar plate is a nice option because it makes the reduction in an area of lesser comminution, reduces the need of bone graft, and avoids the extensor tendon injuries. It's almost perfect. The anatomy favors the volar plate due to their greater space 
between the plate and the flexor tendon, as opposed to the dorsal plate, which is very close to the tendon. There are a lot of papers about complications with and the treatment methods of these fractures. It's very important to define the type of complication. Incorrect technique causing tendon injuries in the flexor and in extensor tendons versus limitations of the technique leading to loss a lot loss of reduction. So in the literature, we can find evidence in favor of an internal fixation method. Analyzing the biomechanics between the assemblies with volar and dorsal plates, they are equivalent in relation to stiffness under cyclic load and failure. But the orthogonal plate system have a great stiffness. Um, that stood that compared the locked plates and standard plates showed that locked plates have greater resistance to the failure and great stiffness to cyclic loading. So why volar plate? Is it the gold standard? Of course, is the, the majority of surgeons prefer volar plate. But the idea was volar fixation of dorsally displaced unstable extra and interarticular distal radius fractures. Volar plates allows anatomic reduction through a volar approach stabilization with a fixed internal fixation device with some subchondral buttress and no violation of dorsal comminuted area. It's important to, man to maintain of an anatomic continuity of the extensor tendon cheats, the periosteum, the dorsal retinaculum, and the vascular supply to dorsal fragments. So is there a place for dorsal plates? The answer is yes. <laughs> of course, the volar plates does not work for all kinds of fractures. So what the indications for dorsal plates? First of all, we have to define the fracture pattern before indicate the dorsal plate. Displaced articular central fragment is a very nice indication for dorsal plate. Pay attention with this fragment. Another one is a, dist, a very distal volar fracture line is important to, to define this line here before to choose your implant. Another is the dorsal ulnar corner fragment, is the die punch fragment. It's a very nice indication to do a dorsal plate, especially in this case, in the center of. Dorsal comminution with intact volar cortical is another very nice indication because the cortical, the volar cortical is intact. So you have to do a, a dorsal approach to, to make a direct reduction and um, put a dorsal plate here. Another one is a, a dorsal sharing fract. That is an uncommon lesion less than 30% of all the fractures, but in no true series in the literature. But it's important to, do, to pay attention with the step. For example, in this case, surgery by dorsal approach with a specific fragment fixation and a dorsal plate associated to make a, a better support for the fracture. We can see a, a very good result. So how to do the dorsal approach? 
I'll show you a video from AO as like uh, I do in my practice. Dorso radial carpus. Scissors are used to mobilize the skin and subcutaneous flaps around the fascia over the extensor retinaculum in the radial and the ulnar direction. Distally, the branches of the superficial radial nerve must be protected. The course of the long extensor tendon of the thumb in the third extensor compartment can be seen as it's opened in a distal to proximal direction. The long extensor tendon of the thumb is mobilized and snared. After this tendon has been retracted in an ulnar direction, the long and short radial extensor tendons of the wrist can be seen as they emerge from the second extensor compartment. Proximal to the extensor retinaculum, the posterior interosseous nerve can be exposed and snared over the point of attachment of the interosseous membrane to the radius, as shown here. Usually, a segment of this nerve is resected in this approach to reduce post-operative pain in the wrist. The second extensor compartment is elevated subperiosteally in a radial direction. The course of the short extensor tendon and the long abductor tendon of the thumb are shown here with the scissors before they pass into the first extensor compartment. Because the fourth extensor compartment is elevated subperiosteally in an ulnar direction, the dorsal surface of the distal radius is exposed. The wrist capsule is transected parallel to the dorsal rim of the radius, and the corresponding joint surfaces of the distal radius and the proximal carpal row are exposed for inspection. Now I'll give you some tips for dorsal approach, radial, central, and ulnar approach. Radial is for the lateral column. Watch out for the radial nerve branch head between the first and second tunnels. The central approach is indicated for the radial and intermediate columns. It is performed under the second and fourth tunnels. It's important to use this to do the orthogonal plates for dorsal fractures. And um, associated with the arthrotomy, it allows an excellent visualization of the joint. Ulnar access is for the intermediate column, as in the case of die punch isolated, for example. So the arthrotomy provides a great exposure of the joint surface, allowing inspection and repair of scapholunate ligament injuries, as well as reduction of joint fragments under direct view. We do the same approach for the, the dorsal, and uh, we open in the third compartment to release the extensor pollicis longus. And uh, we perform the arthrotomy just out to the radial lunate ligament, the radial lunate tri triquitum dorsal ligament. Here we can see a scapholunate injury. It's very nice to, to treat this, this kind of injury by this approach. In this anatomical specimen, we can identify the dorsal ligament and we can see the joint and the, we, we can reduce the fracture by direct view. And now, a dorsal view of the fracture. It is important to do this 
is a better than arthroscope view. And uh, we can perform the direct reduction and about bone graft, direct placement of the cancellous bone graft in the focus and coverage the plates with a retinaculum flap. So how to avoid extensor tendon injury? This prospective multicenter trial showed 22 complex factor with five irritation of the tendons in the second compartment. And then other paper show us how to describe a, a flap to, the, to protect the extensor tendon. The flap is, is will cover the implants. In this case, at two plates, it's possible to do a flap to cover them and then to protect the tendons. Now we, we talk about the many types of dorsal plate. We have a P plate, the first one, and T plate, A plate, specific fragment plates, a double dorsal plates, and our orthogonal system. The evolution of locking plates for distal radio fractures gave us a new technologies. And uh, for me, the, the most important is variable angle with lock and compression plate. But VLCP is not a bushing or friction fit locking mechanism. There is no cross treating. Final locking step can deform the screw and or plate treated. Therefore, check the final screw position prior to final tightening. The orthogonal system, as I told before, is more stiff than the volar plate. These plates were developed according to three column theory by Rick and Hegazon in 1996. It's available for dorsal, barton, fracture, die punch, isolated or no, radial stylot, and dorsal uno, una corner. Here is an example of dorsal fracture with a T plate and the keywords associated to fix all the fragments in the fracture. Another option for us to use a, a dorsal approach is in, in cases of you need a double approach. This is a melon for fracture for fragments. And um, the option was to fix the volar side with a volar plate. As we didn't have a special plate at that time, we associated a tension band for distal lunar fragment. And uh, we put another plate on the dorsal way to fix the dorsal fragments. And this is the final X-ray and the good functional results. Another indication in the indication is dorsal marginal fracture. It's impossible to use a volar plate here. But pay attention, it's not a die punch factor isolator. So we use a dorsal plate to solve this case. Another indication is for impacted fracture and a dorsal articular fracture with the volar cortical intact. Another dorsal plate to solve. And in this case, in the extremely distal volar fracture, it's impossible to use another volar plate here um, unless you use a um, hook plate associated or not another tension band, another um, method associated. Um, the CT scan show us the comminution in, in specific details for these fragments. We 
use the dorsal P plate, is a, a node plate. And uh, here you can see after remove the plate or surgery in two stages. And uh, excellent functional outcome. These other cases are female, 47 years old, with a dorsal ulnar fragment and distal roller fragment as well. The option was the orthogonal system, and we got a very nice functional outcome. Other female patient, 52 years old, and the CT scan is important to define the fragments. We can see in the movies from the CT is a very helpful. You can see they step in, in the, into the joint. And here is a 3D reconstruction, it's a, a very nice yeah. image to help us too. And uh, post up with an, a new plate, same as a P plate in the past. At six months, the results show the complete recovery and good range of motion. The other patient is a man, 38 years old. He had a distal radius fractures and a scaphalonate injury associated. You can see here the fracture and the injury of the ligament. And we, we put up two plates in the radius and repair the ligaments and fix with key wires. Um, the last indication that I put here is a malunion in the distal radius fractures. And the CT scan shows us the articular step, important articular step. And the option was to do an osteotomy and dorsal plate fixation. This is the final result. So in conclusion, dorsal plate have a precise indications. Radiocarpal arthrotomy is viable. Coverage of the plate for tendon protection with the flaps from the retinaculum is a, a lot of models from plates. You have to customize in, for your patient and consider the surgery in two stages. The first one is open reduction and internal fixation. And the second, hardware removal. Thank you very much. Well, Tufi, very, very beautiful. I was in doubt of a lot of things. And now you answered many questions, many doubts. I was thinking about this lecture all of the last two or three weeks. Beautiful, beautiful. Now I understand these indications, but I have some doubts and I, and I want us to discuss these things before we move to the knee part. The thing is, first of all, it's interesting that you, you have now many different implants for this, this, uh, these uh, patterns. This is not available for the vast majority of the surgeons in Brazil, in India, especially on public systems. Uh, yeah, you, you know that, sir. But it's very interesting to know that. But the thing is, first of all, there is a kind of implant that you use it in the beginning. It's not a plate. It's something like a, a key wire or uh, with a, 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 a something in between. What is that? You show it one case without a plate. That was a plate and something else. What was uh -huh. that? What's the kind of implant? The, that implant was developed by Dr. Um, from Hawaii. His name is, I remember. Robert Madoff. Yes, Robert Madoff. Bob Madoff, yes. Thank you, Andre. Madoff uh, is important to do the specific fragment fixation. And it, there is a company that sells the implant, but it's, 
it's possible to do the implant with a Kitchener wire. Okay. You can you can do during the surgery inside the surgical center. You can model the key wire into make some implants, and uh, as well you can cut some plates from hand sets and use for specific fragments in the distal radius. It's very very nice to, to uh, I think it's an intelligent idea to to make some difficult case. Interesting. But the thing is, uh, in spite of the closure of the dorsal retinaculum, what about instability of the tendons? I'm very curious about that. What about instability of stensor policies, longus instability of uh, ECRL and ECR ECRB, uh, even if you close the retinaculum? Uh, in spite of tendon irritation, I'm curious about post-operative tendon instability leading to pain. What are your thoughts about that? I'm, I really want to know this, sir. We have to preserve the retinaculum tunnels. Okay. Yeah, uh, we open before the, the joint and preserve after the joint. So we don't have an instability of the tendons. Okay. Okay, okay. And one thing, when we think about some other diseases, I don't want to compare apples and bananas, okay? Apples and oranges. But if you think about Kimbox disease, for example, sometimes doing the ne neurotomy of the dorsal branch of the pin is something uh -huh. good for pain control to avoid pain postoperatively. It, it was mentioned on that uh, videotape you show with us. Do you do it regularly to avoid pain postoperatively? This is a good question, sir. Yes. In the, I'm all, all my surgeries in the dorsal uh, of the wrist, I try to do the neurectomy uh, in the nice. posterior interosseous nerve and anterior interosseous nerve as well, in the same okay. way. Okay. If you open more deep, you find the anterior interosseous nerve. Um, it's important to cut them to provide to prevent the pain in the in the joint. Okay, in, you you mean to avoid pain post operatively, but yeah. does it lead, does it lead to any kind of numbness or permanent numbness on the dorsal part of the hand or not? Not the dorsal not. part of the hand. We see. Uh, innervation from the radial nerve, uh, sensory branch, and yes. the ulna nerve, not from the interosseous nerve. You mean you mean that one that we we have to take care when we operate a decker vein that 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 yes. branch. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Which is not uh, which is not here. It's more uh, radial, so that would be not a problem. Okay, it's a very interesting technique. I understood now, it's beautiful how you see the joint. Before our friends speak, what about, you mentioned, sir, about removal of the implants because removing volar plates is not common in distal radius fractures. I see a lot in my public hospital and we know that. What about the need of removal? Is it common, not common? And the morbidity, the morbidity involved in taking out the plate or the plates? The morbidity is a, a, a little. I don't matter about this. Okay. I indicate to remove all the dorsal implants to prevent a, a tendon injury. Okay. In my routine, I, if I use the dorsal plate, I remove the dorsal plate. And If I and, use the uh, volar plate, I don't need to, yes. to remove it. And how long time? You mean one year, uh, two years, eight months post-operatively? Which is the minimum time? Six months. Six months. Okay. Six months. Okay. And, and you're taking all of them. Interesting. Dr. Robinson, your thoughts about this un unusual... Sergio, uh, Sergio, thank you very much. Uh, Tufi. My dear friend, congratulations, very nice cases, challenging cases, very beautiful results. 
And uh, we, we, we can see here, uh, similar to the TDL plateau or for the pilon, uh, we have to identify where is the fracture line and where you would like to put your thumb to uh, maintain the reduction of the fracture. It's very, very important to recognize when to go dorsal. This is mm -hmm. the, the key message of your lecture, in my opinion. And this is a, a very, very challenging uh, 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 management of this kind of fracture. So uh, I'd like to, to tell you, uh, Sergio, that we can do the same technique of uh, Professor Medoff uh, using K wires plus uh, uh, and one third tubular plate that is cut. Okay. Uh, and we, we put the plate over the K wires pre-bent and we can support uh, making a subchondral rafting. Uh, it's like support. a buttress system. Huh? It's yeah, like a buttress. You know, it's, it's not like a buttress, it's a rafting, rafting K wires to maintain the reduction of the subchondral bone. So this is very, very interesting technique. Very interesting. We can very customize and with a cost effective, effective technique, no? And, but and congratulations, very nice. Very nice, but Dr. Tufi, be, before Dr. Weinstein speaks, I wanna listen to him. Dr. Tufi, listen to me. The vast majority of the public systems in India, in Brazil, we don't have such beautiful plates. So how can we adapt without any adventure, but uh, thinking outside of the box, how can we, which implants can we adapt if so to do something similar to, to, to that, because your technique is beautiful, but your implants, they are not, I would say, available in the majority of the systems. How to uh, think outside of the box, adapting without being very adventurous? Yes, we have some solutions for this problem. Uh, here in Belo Horizonte, we don't have uh, uh, these implants available in, in all the systems of, uh, as well in the other countries. Yeah. Um, so we use it to combine the key wires with the normal plates. If you use a, a 3.5 plates for a T plate, normal common T plate for Voller, we can um, combine it with a, some key wires. We can use some uh, sometimes uh, screws of, outside of the plate uh we can combine with a, a spanning plate or a, a x fix i i don't like x fix for distal radius fractures only for <laughs> open fractures but yeah. it's, it's important to have in, in your arsenal yeah to use that your imagination i think is yeah i know as a backup you mean as a backup it's not the first choice but but as a backup ah uh, mm -hmm. yeah but, but it leads to a, not, to a lot of CRPS, to complex regional pain syndrome, reflex sympathetic dystrophy. You mentioned that, uh, and I wanna comment a little bit about that and listen to everybody because this is a problem in my life, a big problem. I'm coming to that in two minutes or in a few minutes. But Dr. Weinstein, I'm really curious about your comments on this. I, I'm not sure, do you have any experience, Dr. Weinstein? I have zero with dorsal plating, any complications you, you found, your experience in that? Yes, actually, I'm a big fan of dorsal plating or specific fragment plating. Thank you, Dr. Tufi, for the brilliant class. Uh, we are very good friends from uh, Sao Paulo and Belo Horizonte, and we, we, we've been in a lot of classes together. Uh, I, have a, I have some experience and um, I think um, there's a trend in fracture treatment to do specific treatment, specific plating treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, since uh, we are in the wrist, in the knee, in the femur, wherever you want it. Uh, so I think Bob Madoff, uh, maybe he was the first one that tried to do uh, this specific, uh, this fracture specific treatment. I think Robinho and we have a lot of good friends that um, have a lot of experience with uh, regular plating with uh, non-locking uh, K-wires and plating like Tarcisio and a lot of our friends from uh, a big trauma group. And they do an amazing job with those uh, materials. 
So uh, the material is not an impediment if you don't do it uh, with the specific plating. Uh, okay. But if you make the principles right, you do the rafting, you use K wires, you bend them, you put them through plates, you have a nice result. This is, you know, this is important for people to understand to feed that this is not, I would say, a world that cannot, that can't be used and reproduce it. Because we all know, my friends, reproducibility is very important. If not, uh, if this webinar doesn't benef benefit uh, people from all around the world uh, with no idea in plants, we are not doing our job. So this is very important. I'm very happy with what Dr. Weinstein mentioned it, about the thing that this is reproducible, Dr. Weinstein, without those, I would say, specific and very expensive implants. But if you use the principle, this is very important. I'm learning a lot. And Dr. Vasudeo, you are uh, the man of thinking outside of the box. Uh, any thoughts about that, sir? Because uh, I, I, before I start, I, I, I talk about reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which is a big problem in my practice. Dr. Vasudeo, any thoughts about dorsal plating or you? you okay. Uh, okay, sir. It's a wonderful presentation. And uh, implants are very nice. They are uh, mesmerizing implants and it's very looking very good on x-rays. But in practice, I think in, <laughs> I also treat a number of them. The anatomical correlation does not reflect with the functional correlation. So in my thought, though the radiological union is perfect, but that is not synonymous with the, the functional outcome. So most of the time that Sergio said, you get a sympathetic dystrophy, you get a shoulder pain, shoulder hand pain. These are the so many things are there. And when you use a dorsal blade, you are violating the two, two times our dorsal tendons. They are very notorious for stiffness as well as arthropathic fibrosis, tendon yeah. tendinopathy. So it is, a, it, is, it is not a very good surgery for beginner. If you an advanced surgeon like you, and they are, uh, the handling is very precise with the soft tissues. Then and then you can get a very good result. Otherwise, yeah. in I think uh, the fibrosis around the tendons may produce stiffness, replus dystrophy, and so many other complications. Wonderful presentation, wonderful cases, and wonderful radiological picture and even functional outcome. But I still in doubt Sometimes you may get some problems with the beginners. I suppose. yeah, you know, you know, Doctor Vasudeo. The older I get, the more I understand that fracture management is a soft tissue procedure. I have heard that a lot of times. So the thing is, we must be very careful with soft tissue procedures. Uh, uh, they are as important as the bone. This is very important. And this is what Dr. Uh, Vasudeo is mentioning. But as I have the opportunity of having wonderful trauma surgeons here and a hand surgeon, let me talk a little bit about a problem in my life. And I, 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 I am always learning with hand surgeon. I have a, a, a big clinical experience in managing post-operative CRPS, with, which is complex uh, uh, regional pain syndrome, the old reflex uh, sympathetic dystrophy. Dr. Tufi, I've been listening for five years about using vitamin, vitamin C uh, to manage this, this uh, uh, CRPS or reflex uh, sympathetic dystrophy. And some guys, they are using it not only to treat, but to prevent. So they start using in elective surgeries one month before the, the surgery, vitamin C, not only uh, post-operative, but pre-operatively. Uh, any thoughts about that, sir? I'm always trying to learn things on, on, on CRPS because I manage a lot of cases in my public hospital and some in my office. I have good experience. In the end of the story, the vast majority they, they do well, but I do, uh, I, I manage them with vitamin C, B complex, uh, pregabalin, pre, pre, pregabalin, and sometimes amitriptyline. And I put all of them together. 
Uh, I learned it with, with physiatrists, physiatrists, that uh, it's an aggressive problem and you must be more aggressive in the management to deal with CRPS. Your thoughts about that, sir? I'm very interested on how you manage that post-operatively. And I would like to listen to the other panelists because this is very important. As important as being a good surgeon is being able to manage complications Robinho, intraoperative and postoperatively. So your thoughts about that, sir? Vitamin C, and if you use uh, pre pregabalin, amitriptyline, and B-complex. Uh, Tufi. So um, this is a big problem for us. For us, big But problem. In this array of fractures, we don't have in, in, uh, in a most of the cases a... Uh, this kind of problem we have in the in the other other kind of injuries but uh for me is a a multi a multi-professional um treatment approach yes and, a multi-professional approach yes and we need to work together with the the therapist and the physiotherapist um i don't like to to use a lot of kind of medicines for this problem. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to treat the pain. The most important for me to treat the pain. But uh, I like to, to give some orientations for the patient. And uh, to, it's important to hear the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like to, to do the surgery and... Uh, I will see next month or next week. Is, it, it doesn't work for me. I have to, to, to stay close to my patients and yeah. uh, I have to spend my time to hear them. And yes. uh, the important for me is give medicines for against the pain. The pain is the, the, uh, the main problem. Uh, yeah. Sometimes we have a... a a depression it, it's terrible for us terrible to treat let me depression. tell you something let me tell you something i'm sorry to interrupt you but i would manage that now this is very serious when i operate middle aged ladies and i have crps and i have more experience than i wanted i would mention that they develop psycho emotional depression this is described in literature medicine helps on that Pregabalin helps on that. This is uh, uh, written in literature. Amitriptyline helps on that, and they sleep better. They tell me, mm -hmm. I am sleeping better after you gave me amit amitriptyline. But you have to be very, I would say, you have to be very, uh, very available for them, Dr. Tufi. I heard that from other hand surgeons. From a psycho-emotional point of view, they become weak especially if we are talking about middle-aged women. I have a big experience with that. Many times I'm very serious. They cry on the medical appointment. And when you mm -hmm. manage the pain and when you manage depression with medications, talking a lot, they get better. I, he I heard that from so many older surgeons and I see that very frequently. And I have a lot of patience to talk to them, to listen to them, it's very important. You know, when you have a lot of pain, many times, Dr. Tufi, psycho-emotional depression comes. This is uh, written in the literature and many people saw that. So I really want to listen to you guys. You see, Tufi, if you deal with uh, upper limb uh, trauma, I don't know, inferior limb, it's impossible not to have these problems. You fully agree with me. It's impossible not to have these complications. Uh, you, you uh, I, I am sure you suffer as I do because it's not easy. It's not five minutes and in, in five days. It took months to get better. This is a very, this is written in literature and in many papers. So I really want to listen to these wonderful trauma surgeons. Robinho, when you see, I don't know if the inferior limb and in the upper limb and these patients, they get psycho-emotional depression. A lot of guys have seen this. How do you manage these cases? Uh, physiotherapically, from a medicamentous point of view, I really want to listen to you and the other panelists. 
So I completely I completely agree with you guys. Uh, I have some patients with uh, this kind of problem. Uh, here in our hostel, we work in a team and we uh, usually refer our patients to the anesthesi anesthesiologist specialized okay. in these kind of problems. He sometimes manage and with a combination of medicines, like you mentioned, and uh, uh, we usually uh, uh, perform some blocks as well, um, okay. several blocks. And uh, we, uh, it, took, it, it takes sometimes six, seven, eight months, eight months to recover yes. the function sure. and for pain control and to recover the bone quality. So yeah. this is a huge problem for us as well. Yeah, Dr. Weinstein, I am sure you have seen cases like that. How do you manage them? Uh, I'm very interested because you do a lot of trauma. I only do upper limb trauma. And I want to know Dr. Weinstein and Dr. And Robinho. Uh, this is very common in the, in the upper limb, but is this common in the inferior limb? Dr. Weinstein. It's not. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's not that common, but it happens sometimes. I think when you are treating uh, the pain of the patient, it starts before the surgery. Uh, okay. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of blocks and also uh, preemptive anesthesia. Uh, okay. I, 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 I do a lot of hopivacaine and clonidin before uh, surgery. So I think in most of the cases uh, when the patient had a lot of uh, control of the pain uh, and it can move uh, much faster and uh, uses much less uh, medications afterwards and we have less complication that we used to do, but should have, but uh, that's just uh, an opinion. No, sure. And, he, and we know the earlier we start physio, the better will, it will be, but sometimes it's not available. But I want to ask Dr. Elio, because he deals with, he deals with a lot of sequelae. He deals, he deals with a lot of complex cases. Dr. Elio, I never asked you that before. In spite of the orthopedic problems, when you see them with a lot of pain and sometimes reflex sympathetic dis, dystrophy, Dr. Elio, how do you manage them? Do you have any different thoughts? You deal with so much complications. I'm very interested in your point of views regarding pain when you receive this uh, sequelae, generally in, in the tibia, sometimes in the femur. How do you see that? Um, the, the, main, uh, the main reason for, for sympathetic syndromes in the lower limb, I, in my experience, uh, are the patients with the lack of physio treatment. I think, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, in the upper limbs, I have a limited experience in sympathetic syndromes in the upper limb, but in the lower limbs, the most of the cases are related to lack of, of uh, weight charge and, and, and physio mainly. Uh, in uh, the... the uh, the use of antidepressives and triptyline, I, I have a good experience with them. I think it's a good, it's a good, it's a good way to treat the the the, the, the compass pain and sympathetic syndromes. But mm -hmm. in, uh, I'm sorry to not to to add more in the discussion of the upper limbs. Oh no, 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 but, but it's important. I have seen a few times, Dr. Robinson, as I like to say, feet, foot or feet, red as a tomato, a lot of edema, a lot of pain, and, and they develop, Dr. Robinson, something, it's not only pain, it's what we call dysesthesia. So whenever they put some trousers, some socks on the, on the leg, they feel a lot of... Uh, 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 of of uh, of inching, this is called it. This is different sensations that they should have. This is called dysesthesia. So it's difficult to manage that. You know, uh, sometimes in the upper limb, I have a more experience than I wanted. They say if I put my sleeve upon my forearm, it itches too much. It brings difficult for me to wear. I would say uh, uh, shirts 
you know, with long sleeves on the, on the forearm. So it's difficult, but uh, as Dr. Tufi said, is multi-professional. Wow, we have to go to who have do good physio. I think that uh, some medications is important. Uh, vitamin C has a, a role for sure, but this is difficult. And before we go to the knee part, in which Dr. Elio and Dr. Uh, well, all of you will help. I am here just to learn. Dr. Vasudeo, uh, your experience in reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Again, I state, this is a problem in my life. So any experience, sir, how do you manage that? Uh, especially, sir, because it's interesting. You deal with wonderful results with four patients very poor patients who don't have good access or fast access to physio. It shall be a problem in your practice, I guess. How do you manage that, Dr. Vazudeo? Yeah, it's a probably problem to the patient as well as to the surgeon who is treating. It is very difficult yes. to convince them. So I give yeah. a short uh, course of a steroid for at least for three weeks, one week, uh, uh, three times a day, for one week, two times a day, and one week, plus pre gabaline plus good physiotherapy, Okay. Add some oil for massage and vitamin C and be complex. Even in one and a half month, the problems more or less it's solved. And then patient then it, uh, he regains the confidence that he's going to be better and better. He does a better physiotherapy and within three, four months, the, everything becomes uh, not normal. You know, you know I'm going to tell you something, sir, before we move to the knee part in which you will all help me a lot. I learned it. Uh, I learned it something this year with a very good shoulder sur surgeon, which is when these patients, I guess, in the inferior limb also, when they develop so much pain because of reflex sympathetic dystrophy, they develop something which is called cinesiophobia, cinesiophobia, fear of moving, and from a physiopathological point of view. If you are fear of, if you have fear of moving, the diseases go in cycles. It's written in many books. So we have to break the cycle with motion. As all of you are, are mentioning, Dr. Tufi, he fully agrees with me. You break the cycle of, of this, of CRPS with pain control and motion. And many times I have seen Dr. Robinson was uh, mentioning some post-operative Osteoporosis. I, I guess you were telling that, Dr. Robinson, because they are, uh, they are, they are not using the limb, especially on the tibia. I have seen, and they are uh, afraid to walk. And it's beautiful to see. I have seen sometimes when you manage pain and they start walking again after some months, the X-ray is much better in terms of osteoporosis. I'm sure you saw that, Dr. Robinson. Sure. Yes, completely sure. Uh, it's very, very uh, uh, challenging to deal with yeah. this kind of problem. Sure. Uh, sometimes the patient presents chronic pain for several months and over yes. a year. And uh, sometimes the bone quality is very, very poor and the recovery yes. is very, very slow. So slow. this is a challenge. It's, yeah. it's very hard. Yes, and now, and now we will move to the knee part in which I'm here to learn. All of you guys are gonna help us too much. Dr. Elio has a big experience. So, so this is, now let's see the secrets and the pearls on, uh, on uh, Hoffa fracture. <clears throat> is this something new to me? I'm very curious and all of you guys are gonna help me too much. Okay, can I start? Yes. Can you see my screen? Yeah, you can start, you can start. Perfect, perfect. So thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure to be here among friends. Uh, this is my disclosure. I will talk about the Hoffer fracture. I think my biggest conflict of interest, that is I love this topic. And sometimes I, I, I became, I became uh, full of emotional uh, things about treating Hoffer fractures. So uh, the goals of this presentation are to identify the appropriate approaches according to the fracture patterns and to present some reduction and fixation strategies uh, based on the classification systems developed 
for the half of fractures. So this is the classic uh, lateral neural classification system for half of fractures. We use this classification uh, still currently. Uh, it was published maybe in 1978, if I'm not sure, if I'm sure. Uh, and this is a very, very helpful uh, classification systems beca system because it, uh, uh, it helped us to choose the correct way to treat some kinds of half of fractures, especially for fractures of the lateral condyle of the femur. Uh, this is the type one fracture with the, uh, that is the, the most frequent uh, fracture type with a vertical fracture line running through the posterior cortex of the distal femur. Uh, the type two is a true osteochondral fragment and depending on the fracture size, we can have a subtypes, uh, uh, subtypes A, B, and C. And the less frequent type is a more horizontal fracture line, more stable. However, in our daily practice, we figured out that some patients, uh, um, several patients actually, present some depressed area of comminution in the weight-bearing zone of the lateral condyle. And for that reason, we proposed a, mo a modification in the lateral nerve classification system, adding the so-called type one variant fracture. The type one variant fracture is the type one with associated comminution zone in the weight bearing area of the lateral condyle. And it was published some years ago in injury. And this is a very, very interesting paper, beautiful paper from China, from the Kong Feng Lu group. And the authors uh, in 2017 published in JBJS, uh, they mapped 74 uh, isolated lateral and medial condyle fractures of the distal femur. It's a huge number. And uh, you can see here in this uh, picture, uh, the lateral half of fractures are the red lines and the medial are the green lines. And you can see that lateral half uh, are completely different from medial half of fractures. The lateral half of fractures are much more frequent. They are more concentrated in the weight bearing zone of the lateral condyle and they are a little bit more vertical. Medial half of fractures are less frequent. They are more spread and they are a little bit more uh, 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 horizontal. For that reason, we uh, think that applying the Latiner classification system for the medial half of fracture is not actually a good idea. Uh, fortunately, the authors showed that in almost 50% of cases, we have some degree of comminution in the weight bearing zone. Uh, this is very important because when we add uh, the, the, the type one variant fracture for the classic lateral nerve classification, we didn't know the percentage of patients who presented, uh, who present actually the comminution zone, the weight bearing uh, area of the lateral condyle. dial. And this is a very, very helpful information because uh, the management of a lateral nerve type one fracture is completely different from the man management of a type one variant fracture. So this is a, another paper from the same group and the authors uh, performed a biomechanical study comparing uh, several uh, types of fixations for half fractures. And they found that a fixation from posterior to anterior with a buttressing plate uh, uh, increases the stability of the construct, thereby providing a more stable fixation. So for that reason, for latiner type one fractures, the most common fracture pattern is not a good idea to uh, do an anterior approach and using only leg screws for fixation. This is not stable enough 
to provide a good functional outcome and a good result in terms of fracture uh, uh, stability and healing. So for that reason, the most stable fixation for that kind of fracture is a, a buttressing, a put, posterior lateral buttressing plate uh, plus leg screws from the back to the front, like you can see here in this picture. And this is the approach. It's not a challenging approach. Uh, the patient is usually put in, in prone positioning and you can, here you can see the proximal, the distal, uh, uh, the lateral, and the medial. And you can see the postural lateral approach with uh, around 10 centimeters length. And uh, the, the window is a very, very simple window between the iliotibial tract and the biceps tendon. For the vast majority of postural lateral half of fractures, you don't need to identify the peroneal nerve. For the type one fracture, you just need to identify the interval, the interval that is a little bit more lateral between the iliotibial tract and the biceps tendon, and you can address the posterior lateral surface of the distal femur easily to perform the, to fit your plate and buttress the fracture line. Here is uh, the, the approach that is the same skin incision, but to address the osteochondral fragment of the lateral type two fractures, uh, uh, the, the approach is a little bit different. We go a little bit more medial at the interval between the biceps and the peroneal nerve, because if you go medially, like you can see here, it's a little bit dangerous because you can have the possibility of an iatrogenic injury of the popliteal vessels. For that reason, we recommend using the window between the peroneal nerve and the biceps tendon, uh, and you can safely address the uh, osteochondral fragment of the half a fracture. This is a video of a cadaver limb, and you can see the proximal, the distal, the popliteal fossa, and the skin incision postural laterally. And uh, this is the biceps and the peroneal nerve. And you can identify the interval between the iliotibial tract and the biceps tendon to apply your plate. And medially to the, the, the peroneal nerve, you can address. But I, I, uh, as I told you, I recommend using a, an approach a little bit more lateral between the nerve and the biceps, and it's safer. And here you can see a type one fracture uh, managed with a postural lateral approach and the fixation using a buttressing plate uh, plus a leg screw from the back to the front. For lateral nerve type two fracture, type one variant fracture, the management is different because if you go posteriorly with a postural lateral simple approach, uh, you can't address the central zone of comminution. And usually this fragment is a huge fragment. It's a big fragment. And you have to address this fragment to perform the reduction and proper fixation. So here you can see uh, the type one variant fracture. And this is um, a patient. You can see the, the CT scan where, where a considerable fragment in between uh, the half and the anterior part of the femur. And we addressed using the postural lateral approach to apply uh, uh, our buttressing plate uh, and uh, some leg screws from the posterior to anterior. And uh, we performed the Gerdes tubercle osteotomy. Uh, the Gerdes tubercle, tubercle osteotomy is the, the way to address the central zone of comminution to apply some leg screws, like you can see here in this figure. Uh, and here, the Herbert screws applied uh, from distal to proximal uh, to fix the central zone of comminution. And this is the x ray, and this is the fixation of the osteotomy with a 3 5 uh, millimeter screw with a washer and four months. Postoperatively, you can see this result and the patient walking with a very reasonable 
uh, result and uh, coming back to the functional activities. Uh, for letter node type two fractures, uh, using anterior approaches and fixing from anterior to posterior is completely contraindicated because of the threads of the screw uh, of the screws will not bypass the fracture line and you have not efficient compression of the fracture and you have no stability and the, the incidence of uh, reduction failure and, and, and fixation fa failure using anterior to posterior screws for half a fracture is extremely high. And for that reason, the recommendation is using the interval between the nerve and the biceps and using uh, leg screws from posterior to anterior, like you can see here. And uh, you have to use counter Think screws uh, to cover uh, uh, to 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 not damage the cartilage of the patient, the articular surf surface of the the knee. So uh, for lateral nerve type one variant and for lateral nerve type three fractures, our approach is a little bit different. We usually do a, an anterolateral parapatellar approach, and we can address. Uh, the, the central zone of comminution or the lateral type three fracture from the front. So this is a, a more familiar approach for us. This is safer, but the problem when using anterior approach to treat half a fractures is that the reduction of a half a fracture is performed with the knee in full extension. And to see a half a fracture using an anterolateral approach, you have to put the knee in full flexion and you uh, increase the displacement of the half a fragment. So uh, the challenge is the reduction. It's much more easier. Uh, it's uh, more, much more familiar for us, but the reduction is challenging because you have to apply a Weber clamp to uh, 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 perform your reduction and sometimes you have to apply some force and it, it's a, a little bit hard to get the reduction, but it's a very, very interesting technique using anterior to posterior leg screws combined with this horizontal plate. It's a simple one third tubular plate, locked or unlocked plate, and you can address some degree of stability to increase the, the stiffness of your construct, thereby diminishing the risk of fixation failure. This is a very interesting case that we have operated some weeks ago. This patient suffered a motorcycle accident and presented with uh, this knee flexion. Uh, stiff, uh, the knee was completely stiff in flexion. Uh, you can see that the patient presented a malunion of the proximal tibia and potentially a uh, patella baja as well. And this patient presented a latinar type three fracture. And interestingly, the patella was entrapped into the fracture zone, into the fracture, into the fracture line, you can see here. And the, the mechanism of injury was a knee flexion with the patella entrapment into the fracture zone. So this is very rare. I, I noticed that there is a publication from India with the same mechanism, the same case, very, very interesting and rare case of half a fracture. So we addressed the fracture from the front using the anterolateral parapatellar approach. And here in this picture, you can see the patella into the fracture zone. And we applied uh, the, the, the Weber clamp to perform the reduction. It was challenging. It was not uh, easy. And uh, the fixation was performed with anterior to posterior leg screws combined with a, a Herbert screw to address the fixation of a small osteochondral fragment. And we applied the concept of the horizontal plate to enhance the stability and the stiffness of the construct. And here you can see the anatomic reduction and the stable fixation of the fracture. We are actually doing a biomechanical study comparing these kinds of fractures 
uh, the, this kind of fixations, uh, these four fixation methods for half or fractures. And we hope that we have the answer uh, of the real role of the horizontal plate in the treatment and the management of half or fractures uh, in, the, in the near, near future. This is a, another interesting case. Uh, this patient is 60 years old. He uh, presented with uh, this kind of uh, half a fracture. He was treated in another hospital. Uh, it was performed, it was actually a Lutner type one variant fracture as well. And he was managed with uh, uh, leg screws from the front to the back and uh, 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 a leg screw uh, also to fix the small, chondro, as the small uh, depressed fragment of the central zone of, of the weight bearing zone of the lateral condyle. And like you can see here, uh, four months later, the, the patient presented with a valgus deformity and a knee stiffness and severe pain and uh, claudication. And was I, I was thinking with my, my partner, Gigi Santana, that uh, he does trauma with me and in our hospital and was, uh, he was thinking with me and uh, what is the best way to treat this patient? Uh, it's it's, it's uh, reasonable to think about a salvage procedure or a replacement, a knee replacement. He is 60 years old. So we decided to try some salvage uh, procedure to, uh, to increase the, the survival of this knee. And uh, we did a DCT scan in, you can see here the malunion of the half a fracture and the depressed zone with a, a, a very, very a symptomatic malunion uh, around the knee. And uh, we prototyped uh, the, the CT scan for a better understanding of the fracture pattern. Sometimes we do that. Uh, I, think, I think it's maybe an overkill, but it, it seems like uh, it, it clarifies my, 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 um, my pre-operative planning on how is the, what is the correct plane for the osteotomy. It's, it makes easier my way to treat the, the, the malunion when I do the prototype and sometimes we use this interesting tool. And we decided to put the patient in lateral positioning, like you can see here, we performed a double approach, anterolateral and posterolateral approach. Like you can see here, we applied a K wire just uh, in the, the, the level of the deformity and the, the plane of the Hoffa malunion. And uh, here you can see the osteotomy, the chisel crossing, uh, running uh, across the, the malunion site. And after correction of the valgus of the after correction of the deformity, uh, we applied some K wires from the front to the back to uh, keep, to maintain the reduction. And we addressed the depressed zone uh, to, for, to perform a restoration of the curve of the distal femur using this osteotomy uh, and this chisel, like you can see here. And we performed the osteotomy and applied a small fragment plate, a two zero, from the handset, uh, uh, small fragment plates to fix the uh, small osteochondral fragment. And we applied uh, our uh, horizontal belt plate to enhance the, the stability of the construct. Unfortunately, we missed the, the follow-up of this patient. We noticed that he is, uh, after four years, uh, free of a knee replacement, but we have no uh, radiographs, uh, 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 current radiographs of these patients, unfortunately. For medial half of fractures, as I told you, uh, and uh, it was very, very well shown in the paper of the Kong Feng Luo group, uh, the, the medial half of fractures are completely different. And for that reason, uh, we have proposed a new classification system to address the medial half of fractures uh, in combinations with uh, colleagues from Argentina, from Rio, and from Germany. And we uh, proposed these uh, simple, very simple classification systems with uh, just two types. One, type one is a true osteochondral fragment, and type two is uh, the 
seems like the lateral nerve type one fracture with uh, some uh, piece of uh, some piece of uh, uh, it's a, a little bit more vertical, a bigger fragment with some piece of a metaphysial uh, a fragment like you can see here. And we added uh, the type 1C and the type 2C uh, when we have comminution. If you have comminution, you just need to add the C. And we have uh, uh, thereby two types of medial half of fractures, the true osteochondral and the, the bigger uh, fragment, like you can see. And if you have a comminution, we uh, uh, add the type C. So it was published in the Journal, Germ, uh, Journal of Trauma of Germany. And you can see here our treatment algorithm is uh, using a subvastos approach for uh, these type two fractures. And you can apply a buttressing plate like you can see here. And you can address distally the osteochondral fragment using the so-called GAL uh, approach. That is the interval between the medial caput of the gastrocnemius, the medial head of the gastrocnemius, and the gracilis tendon. So, using these both windows, the subvastos approach, you can apply a buttressing plate, and more distally, in between the, the gracilis and the, the medial gastroc, you can address the osteochondral fragment to apply some leg screws from posterior to anterior. And uh, if you have a comminution type 1C or type 2C, our approach is with the patient supine and we perform a long medial as, uh, approach and we use as a reference, as a parameter, the MCL, uh, the MCL and we can uh, address the anterolateral uh, window and, and Anterior medial and the postural medial uh, windows using uh, this uh, uh, extensile medial approach uh, published by the group of Seattle. And it's very, very interesting because we can address both windows using the same skin incision that is the so called Viscontas approach. And this is an interesting case. An interesting case is this patient is a, a, a young boy who suffered a motorcycle accident, presented this medial half of fracture, and we applied a, a, a postural medial approach, a subvastos approach to apply some buttressing plate. And you can see an MCL avulsion fracture, and we have used one third tubular, tubular plate working as a big washer to cover this fragment. And you can see here the GAO approach to address three leg screws from posterior to anterior. And you can see the anatomic reduction and stable fixation. And the patient one year later with a very, very reasonable functional outcome. And this is the last case, a 19 years old a boy year old boy who suffered also, also a motorcycle accident. He presented with uh, uh, an open fracture around the knee and he was treated in the uh, emergency with uh, debridement, fluid irrigation and external fixation for local uh, damage control. And after recovery of the soft tissues, we performed the, the fixation uh, using this uh, protocol. Like you can see here, this is a, a type one fracture and we performed the GAO approach between the gracilis uh, and the, the medial gastroc. And you can see the small window, but we can address the small piece of medial half to perform the fixation from posterior to anterior. And we applied uh, a, a buttressing plate uh, in the distal femur, like you can see here, a distal radius plate just to buttress uh, uh, an avulsion fracture uh, of the, the lateral condyle of the femur. And we, you can see here the fixation of the tibial plateau as well. I recognize that probably I would fix also the posterior lateral fragment of the tibial plateau, but this surgical procedure was extremely uh, time demanding and I decided to not fix the posterior lateral tibial plateau. 
And despite of this, uh, this patient evolved very well with a very reasonable result, uh, even with a severe and complex fracture pattern, like you can see here. As take home message is very important when dealing with a Hoffer fracture, recognize that in almost 50% of cases, we don't have only a type one lateral nerve fracture. We have actually a type one uh, plus uh, a comminution zone in the weight bearing uh, area of the lateral condyle of the femur. And it's a key, uh, it's, it's a very, very important to recognize that because the management is completely different as I show you. Uh, whenever possible, when using fixation, for, when fixing half of fractures, it's important to address the fragment from the back to the front, from posterior to anterior, because as I showed you, a biomechanical stud studies that have shown that, have shown that uh, the, the mechanical stability of a posterior fixation is much more efficient. And AP leg screws plus horizontal plate uh, seems to be a very helpful treatment alternative, but we lack some mechanical and clinical validation and we are still working in that direction. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, uh, my friends, well, very beautiful. I'm so, I would say, happy that I have so many friends which are paranoid as I am with documentation because it's painful. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. I spend I spend big part of my weekends as I'm gonna do today and tomorrow on documentation. It's painful. It's a continuous work, and I'm very happy you do that. And I have some questions, but I am here just to learn. So I have so many specialists here which can contribute to this beautiful. And I wanna start with Dr. Weinstein because you must have a lot of things to say. And I have some questions in the end, but I'm very, I'm sure you will help us a lot in this beautiful and complex topic. I wanna, we, we wanna listen to you, your doubts, your uh, contributions and your comments on this difficult topic, Dr. Weinstein. Well, Dr. Robinson, it's, uh, it's a pleasure, uh, fantastic lesson. I, I think everyone knows Dr. Robinson. He has more than 100 uh, PubMed indexed uh, papers. So sure. it's, it's completely amazing. Um, one thing that uh, just besides the, the fracture uh, classification uh, that I'm really interested in, it's 3D printing so you can prepare to your cases. I'm a big fan of 3D printing. You can just check uh, on Use It, Fix It on uh, Instagram. They just send you the 3D models for you uh, as well. You can find them anywhere, maybe in India also. And how do you do that? Uh, how do you do that in your daily practice? Uh, Andre, thank you very much for your kind words, my dear friend. Uh, Andre, it's... Um... It's a, a little bit hard for us because I, I do 3D printing uh, in malunion cases and to plan uh, osteotomies because it's, uh, we have to pay for that. So we, we don't have, at least here in our hospital, you have to pick the C CT scan and send to a lab and they print for us, but we have to pay for that. And it's not, uh, it's a little bit expensive, at least uh, currently. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a little bit hard to use in every single case. We sure. reserve the 3D printing for uh, malunion uh, osteotomies and for some complex uh, cases when you have to plan in the paper and you have to plan uh, and to be a little bit more familiar uh, or your preoperative plane to uh, gain some time during your surgical procedure. I don't use that for acute fractures. 
Can I make okay. some comments? Can I make some yes, comments, I, Dr. Weinstein? I, I have on one more. Okay, sure. No, no, I'm just, I'm just going to say something to help all of us here in Brazil, and then I want to listen to Dr. Weinstein. So you check this. This is a very complex uh, osteotomy that I have done uh, in a distal elbow mal union. This is the proximal radius, and you can do it like that. So this is something that was done to me by our good friend, Dr. Bruno Gobato, which is the guy who knows most about 3D printing in Brazil. So in these cases that I have in my public hospital, I pay uh, uh, money from my, my pocket because I send him, he does it for free in his house, but I pay for the, the uh, how can I say, the mailing. It's still difficult as Dr. Robinson has said, but I just wanna make, I would say, uh, a, 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 a tribute to this wonderful Brazilian surgeon who has been, he's a shoulder and elbow guy, by the way, but he has, has been helping us too much in developing this technique, but it's difficult, it's very difficult, but I don't agree with, uh, with, what, with, what, uh, with what Dr. Robinson mentioned that it may be overkill. It's not overkill. It's over difficult for us to get it, but it's very useful. And uh, mm -hmm. and I just and I just want to mention that Dr. Bruno he has been doing a, a lot of help in complex cases for uh, reverse arthroplasties with glenoid mm -hmm. defects. So he has mm -hmm. been elemental for the development of this in in Brazil, and he's always there to help us. Just for you to know. But having said that. Dr. Weinstein, please continue. We are eager to, to listen to you, sir. Sir, no, my friend. It's not a sir, it's my friend. <laughs> thank you, thank now. you. That's much better. Uh, actually, I have a question because I think uh, Robinson thoughts are, are very similar to Tufi. It's like a specific fragment type uh, fracture. And I've seen that you did a lot of horizontal belting plates on these fractures. Uh, can you make any comments on that? Because I think it's a, another very interesting technique that you, I, I know that you publish and you use it a lot. Yeah, Andre, uh, you are sure. We, <laughs> we, we love to use that, uh, that tool, that, that kind of fixation. We use that in the tibial plateau fractures and several kinds of tibial plateau fractures, especially for the postural lateral uh, the articular depression uh, to act as a rim plate and with uh, some rafting uh, screws to keep the reduction. We use in the, the proximal humerus fractures to fix uh, some kinds of uh, greater tuberosity fractures. We use in the tibial pilon fractures, a lot of tibial pilon fractures and uh, I, but I think in the distal femur for the half a fracture, the, the function of the, the work of the plate is a little bit different. It's, a, it's to help maintain the reduction because only screws fixation for a femur fracture, it seems to be a little bit weak. Uh, it seems to be a, a little bit insufficient to maintain the reduction because, because we have extremely important sharing forces. Sure. For that reason, and uh, sometimes it's impossible to uh, apply a buttress in postural lateral plate or port postural medial plate because we don't have a metaphysical piece of bone to do that. Sometimes we have the true osteochondral fragment. So mm -hmm. I think this is the, the, the key message of the horizontal plate is to uh, apply a perpendicular implant uh, to uh, apply at least two screws to increase the stiffness of the construct and thereby diminishing the risk of fixation failure. So I sure. love this technique. Sure, you yeah. see Dr. Robinson, Dr. Robinson, mm -hmm. before the others speak, as I do a lot of uh, shoulder and elbow and trauma, we can think a little bit like uh, when you have, uh, I would say a lateral, this is not common, a lateral condyle fracture of the distal humerus in which you can use the same idea, a buttress plate and or 
cannulated screws. Uh, I think that the idea is the same, okay? But the thing is, I noticed it that you didn't use washers in any of the leg screws, any, even when they are not articular. Uh, any reason for not using washers? Robinson. So, no, Sergio, in the vast majority of half of fractures, these uh, uh, screws are articular. Então, okay, uh, again. So this is almost impossible to use that. Okay, Sometimes yes. I no. use, I, I prefer to use when I do osteotomies. So, okay. uh, or if I have some degree of comminution to increase the footprint area. And sometimes yeah. we use plates, small plates as big washers uh, to okay. increase this footprint the idea area. Is the same. And uh, sometimes we use, we use at least calcaneal plates because the footprint area is uh, a little bit bigger and yeah. uh, to cover the entire fracture fragments and to, to, to cover and to contain the, fra the fracture fragments. Yeah, to give stability to, to the construct. Yeah, uh, yeah. Dr. Elio, uh, as a very talented Elizarov and reconstructive surgeon, any thoughts about this? I, uh, it, it interests me the vision of a, a reconstructive and Elizarov surgeon. Uh, any experience in, on, manage, on managing this in a different way? I really want to listen to you. Um, first, I would like to congratulate Hobbison for a brilliant presentation. Um, but in my experience, uh, I think the half of fractures, they must be openly reduced, reduced. So I think uh, to apply an external fixator to a half a fracture is a little bit... Um, too much. It, it's too much, it's wrong. So uh, in cases where I have a, a, a half a fracture associated with other fractures of the, of the uh, distal femur, I usually open the fracture to reduce the, the fragment, the half a fragment. And uh, instead of the buttress plate, I use the, the, the principles of external fixation. But um, I think Hobson, as Hobson said, it's, a, it's, a, it's an articular fracture. So yeah. the use of external fixator in this case is very limited. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and Dr. Vasudeo, uh, I, I, I'm sure you have experience in this, in your complex uh, cases. What do you have to say about this, sir? Robinson, your presentation is excellent. It is crystal clear and <clears throat> algorithm is also very nicely described and it is well within the limits of the ordinary average orthopedic surgeon to understand. The basic principle is of any intraarticular fracture is open reduction and stable fixation. And whatever the possibility you may get, whether screw, plate, or combination, single, double, triple, then that should be done to, pre to preserve the anatomy and for early mobilization. So your idea of combin combining two together, that is plate, whatever it may be, whether it is giving, not giving a very rigid fixation, but it helps in stable fixation, ancillary with the screw fixation, like I liked it very much. And about the calcaneal fracture, the calcaneal plate you mentioned, I have done it in two cases. It works wonder. It works wonder because there are very many screw holes are there and it is the plate is also of a, a zigzag origin so that it fits. You have a different kind of plates of a calcaneum so that it fits very well in the condyle as well as in the metaphysical area. That there is a good idea because I have no much experience about this. But next time, whenever I come, a large fragment, uh -huh. probably calcaneal plate, may have a place yeah. in the hobas type of effect. You know, you, you know, <laughs> sir, you I, much, I, know, sir, just a second, uh, because I want Robinson to comment on that. I learned it with Robinson in the beginning of the year when we did the scapula webinar, scapula fracture, that he uses uh, the foot and ankle uh, set plates uh, in the in the scapula sometimes uh, yeah. and that is something very interesting because you can use something designed for to one part of the body 
to other parts of the body. You can use that in very specific spine of the scapula uh, fractures. Dr. Robinson was mentioning that. So this is something very interesting for us to, to think about. And now I'm learning with Dr. Robinson that we can use not only the foot and ankle kit in the scapula, but even in the knee. Ah, I don't do knees, of course, but this is very, very interesting. But one thing that I would ask you guys, uh, because I have a lot of experience, much more than I wanted to with elbow stiffness, and I know how difficult it is to do, to deal with that. I am absolutely sure that sometimes, Dr. Robinson, you have some remaining stiffness cases after six months or eight months. I guess it's impossible for you or any guy who does this not to have such, such issues. So how do you manage that? Uh, how has the Jude procedure evolved nowadays? I, I, I wanna listen to you. I wanna listen to Dr. Elio because as a, an, uh, an external fixator specialist, because uh, in the end of the story, Dr. Uh, Robinson, Robinho, in the end of the story, sometimes we evolve with serious uh, knee stiffness. Uh, I don't know, after one year or seven or, or almost one year and how to manage that when it's very limiting for uh, uh, walking. Uh, Sergio, this is a, uh, actually a problem that we deal with we, uh, in our daily practice. Uh, fortunately, it's not so common with the half of fractures. Uh, okay. Sometimes we have some difficult uh, gain of extension, a full extension, with, especially when we apply posterior approaches. And if I see that the patient is not going very, doing very well uh, with uh, some three or four weeks, or I months. go with the patient. Uh, no, weeks. If a the week, patient week. is not, yeah, if, if the patient is not going well with a uh, range of motion, Sometimes I go with the patient to, for a manipulation under anesthesia. It's um, sometimes the, you gain uh, the range of motion, but post uh, the, the manipulation, the, the following the manipulation, you have some loss of uh, range of motion as well. And this is a huge, pro a huge problem. Uh, I reserve the, the approaches I, I think the, the stiffness, the knee stiffness is more common for floating knee and for type uh, C3 type fractures of the distal femur, but for half of fractures, fortunately, they are fortunately. not so common. Yeah, fortunately, they fortunately. are not so common. Yeah. Okay, uh, and I have heard something I'm just talking about because I, I, I am very uh, curious to learn all of the time. Some guys talk about the mini Jude. What is the mini Jude? For, for me? The mini Jude. It's a smaller Jude mm -hmm. approach. Does it yeah. still exist? Yeah, uh, Sergio, uh, actually, we have several, several techniques for, for treatment of knee stiffness. We have okay, minimally, minimally invasive procedures. There is a publication from the group of Into. The, from the Rio de Janeiro, that is very, very interesting. It's a MIPO technique. You can release the medial aspect of the knee and perform some- uh, uh, Windows, release, some windows. Re, yeah, some windows to release the anterior surface of the femur. But uh, actually I prefer the modified Jude approach. We have a publication about that as well. We do the standard lateral approach and we go uh, to release the medial retinaculum from the lateral window. Uh, we don't use, uh, I think it's not necessary to perform the medial window to release the medial retinaculum because we can do that addressing the medial from the lateral. So we go under the patella and we can release the medial ret retinaculum from the lateral skin incision. Excuse but there me, are several... Okay, but you mean under the patella or under the quadricipital tendon? Both. Under Both. the patella to release the retinaculum and we go under the, 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 the quadriceps tendon to release the quadriceps tendon and sometimes we have to release everything and after that 
take out your implants and we go uh, uh, proximally until the greater trochanter. So wow. we leave the whole femur in the vast majority of cases because it's, uh, it's hard. You uh, do the approach is you, you start with a sm small incision and you, you, after, you, you are going to spread your <laughs> incision until, until a whole femur uh, approach, you know? Okay. It's hard. It's hard. Dr. Weinstein, your uh, experience with knee stiffness, this is, this is something that must happen to all of the guys who deal with complex uh, inferior trauma, inferior limb, as all of you guys. How do you manage that? Because, uh, and, and listen to me, we have many juniors here, so they have to understand the principles because you are a senior guy and we have to, uh, and we just want to know how do you manage that at least regularly when you see such a difficult scenario? Actually, uh, the most important uh, lesson that we can teach on uh, knee stiffness uh, is not to get a knee stiffness. Uh, <laughs> you have to have a lot, you have to, to make a rigid fixation. You have to teach the patient how to move uh, her knee. And it's absolutely unacceptable uh, to immobilize the, the, the knee after surgery. You should not do that. that that's the main issue. Um, after you have one, you have a lot of approaches. You have arthroscopic releases that it's something very interesting. And um, uh, Jude, it's also uh, an option, but it's, it's a very aggressive one. Uh, the thing is, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, we did one in our public hospital in which I work with Dr. Elio, uh, which is was uh, we were discussing because it's an, an arthroscopic procedure extra articular. So we would call it an endoscopic procedure just to mention the terminology. But I guess that you were telling me that. And what we did over that time is that we passed a tourniquet and we passed a Steinman pin or a Elizarov pin very high for the tourniquet not to come distal. And then we did it arthroscopically or endoscopically and the patient got really better. So I guess that, uh, how is this nowadays? Is it nice? And, and, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We did it not with a saline, with a CO2, how do you say, uh, like, laparoscopy. I, I don't know how to say CO2 is in English, but the thing is with gas, with gas, it was so interesting. Any clues about this, Dr. Weinstein, Robinho? Yes, uh, Professor Pacola yes. has a paper on that, and Pacola has published that uh, a lot of years ago. He uses a tourniquet and also this time and pin. Uh, I think it's, it's an option, but the main thing is you don't have to get uh, any stiffness. That, sure. That's something that you, you, if you want to prevent the, the event, it's, it's much better. Yeah, you, you know, you, yes, as I tell the residents, sometimes pre prevention is the best treatment. I guess that this is the, this is the idea. But Dr. Robinson, he wants to say something because before no. I listen to the other ones. No? Yes, no, no, Andrea told that it, the technique is from Prof Professor Pacola. The use of a time and pin to keep the, the tourniquet, the Very tourniquet high. proximally, and yeah. the, the, the Jude approach using the endostop, endoscopic technique is Pacola technique. With gas, so, uh, with uh, gas, yes. but is not with selling. Yeah, the Pacola, the, is, this is the, the Pacola technique. There is a video with uh, this technique and he was doing that technique for knee stiffness with a small windows uh, release of the quadriceps tendon percutaneously. Nice. And it's a very, very smart uh, technique that was developed by the group of uh, USP Ribeirão Preto. Lovely, lovely. This was... Because the guy who did this 10 years ago, I guess you know him, he's a wonderful guy, 10 years I don't see him, Guilherme Garofo, he's very good. 
and he was uh, and he did the fellowship with him. He's in Vita now. But uh, Dr. Elio, uh, I know you have some problems like that as as an Elizabeth surgeon. Your concerns about knee stiffness and Jude, uh, I know you have a lot of experience. Uh, as a reconstruction surgeon, I'm more used to knee stiffness. Um, mainly in the public services, uh, we don't have a lot of physio to 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 indicate to the patients. But uh, as as Doctor Andre told. It's better not to have the, the stiffness. So <laughs> sure. when I'm planning a uh, uh, distal femur fracture, usually I extend my fixation to the tibia. And in the course of eight weeks, we we maintain the the, the, the knee in extension, in arthro, arthro dis distraction. We maintain the, the, the fixation in distraction and after eight weeks, we go to the to the to the surgical to the operative uh, to the operative room, and we manipulate the, the the knee. In most of the cases, I I have a little bit of knee stiffness, but it's better than a non manipulated knee. So. I think the, the best way to prevent stiffness is uh, a very close uh, uh, segment with the patient. With the patient. Uh, we have to man maintain um, uh, a routine of, of, of exercises. physiotherapy, exercises, and that's it, I think. Okay. That's uh, my, uh, uh, I have a last question question I am I always uh, always here to learn but Dr. Vasudeo your thoughts on 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 all of this I'm sure you have this problem sir so actually knee stiffness is not a uh, it is a very common problem frustrating problem to the patient and surgeon better is to prevention rather than cure because successively after doing arthrolysis whether you do arthroscopy or open also results are not very encouraging some of okay. them, they get a good range of movement. Some of them, they don't get. And it's a frustrating job for physiotherapy for a long time, two to three months. So my best way is to give, and so do, don't give a chance that nation yeah. will skip. That's all. Okay. Uh -huh. and, and my last question, because I have heard sometimes from Dr. Elio, because we work together, that as I understand, there is a role of arthrodiastasis to avoid some kind of stiffness in the ankle and in the in the knee, do you have any any anything to say about that, Doctor Elio? Uh, uh, in the role of arthrodiastasis to avoid yeah, uh, stiffness, uh, I am not sure if, of, if I am saying things wrong. Yeah, yeah. To avoid stiffness, I think when you do a fixation, uh, an articular fixation, the the femur and tibia, the tibia and ankle, I usually um, maintain the, the articulation and distraction. And I think most of the surgeons that use external fixation as a method of, of, of osteosynthesis do it. But to treat an already stiff articulation, the arthrodiastasis, the... No, uh, the uh, sir, no, no. I, I was mentioning... I was mentioning as a prevention in the acute. Yeah, it's, it's 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 a common it's a common sense in external fixation to maintain the articulation and distraction. Okay, okay, okay. Well, that was a very nice webinar. You know, Dr. Robinson, we are beating three hours now, and this is very common. We always get <laughs> three hours, but I think that the time is uh, the time is coming. So the thing is, uh, I really want to thank you guys. I learned a lot of things. Dr. Tufi, thank you for the beautiful pr presentation. Dr. Vazudeo, Dr. Robinson, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Namaste, sir. I really want to say thank you. Uh, really want to say thank you. Uh, I hope I have you guys in other ones. I am starting a series uh, in the, uh, from September 
to November in arthroscopy stuff in the shoulder because this has been, Fabinho, a, a whole year of trauma. We have done four and Dr. Robinson, he has been with me in three of the four and uh, Dr. Vazudeu, this is the second, Dr. Elio, this is the second, Dr. Weinstein, this is the first, but this is the first, but not the last. Okay, I hope. And Dr. Tufi, I'm counting on you to other staff. It's a pleasure to me. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter, as I always say, to have such a big uh, tool as Orto TV if we don't have right people to, to say right things. I'm so happy and that my, my project after four years now, it's growing uh, not only in shoulder and elbow, but and in the shoulder gear though, but to other staff. And I really want to say thank you. I just want you to guys to say goodbye. I, I'm sure we have more than 1,000. So uh, if you have anything to say, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Andre, Dr. Robinson, you have one minute to say whatever you want. You, you can thank shoot you, me. You, you can shoot me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Sergio. Thanks for inviting me. It was uh, an amazing uh, webinar. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Orto TV. Uh, our dear friends, uh, it was a pleasure to be here among you guys. And uh, thank you, uh, the orthopedic surgeons from India, from South America. And we hope that we can be here again uh, as soon as possible. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Weinstein. It was a pleasure to have you here. A pleasure, okay. Namaste. Namaste. And I just, namaste. Yeah, and I just, and I just, no, Dr. Andre yeah. wants to say something. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. It was an honor. Namaste. Apta Din Shubhu. Ah, <laughs> fantastic. Apta Din Shubhu. Okay, okay. And, and just and just for the and just for the audience to know, in about in a few days, I'm gonna post this event in my uh, in my educational channel in YouTube. It was a pleasure. And uh, uh, just before we finish, I'm not sure, Dr. Uh, Jagan from Orto TV, are you here or Dr. Niraj? I don't know. Thank you so much, Jagan. Yes, so, Jagan, do you want to say something or uh, can we stop, Jagan? It's okay. I'll just stop that session. Okay. Yeah. Nice to hear, sir. And uh, this is really honor for Auto TV to be yeah. part of you guys. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. Bye, bye, people. Thank you bye, very sir. much. Thank Namaste. you. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.